Epitaph for a Spy is a 1938 spy novel by Eric Ambler. Joseph Fardisi is a Hungarian refugee who is effectively stateless. He was born in Sabatka, then in Hungary, but it became Sabotica and part of Yugoslavia following the 1920 Treaty of Trianon. His Yugoslav passport later expired and the authorities refused to renew it. While on holiday in the south of France, he sends a roll of camera film for development, however it turns out to contain pictures which are not his, of nearby naval defences. He is arrested on suspicion of spying. The police realise that Vardasi did not take the pictures, but that someone else at his hotel must have an identical camera, Sai Sai Khan contacts. Vardasi is told to return to the hotel to find the real spy, with the threat that should he fail to do so, he will be deported, which could mean death. Arrived in Sangatiam from Nice on Tuesday the 15th of August 1939. At 11.45am on Thursday the 17th, I was arrested by an agent de police in plain clothes and taken to the commissariat. Epitaph for a Spy by Eric Ambler Adapted by Nick Perry Je ne veux pas travailler, je ne veux pas déjeuner, je veux seulement oublier, et puis je... The village of saint stands in the lee of a small Mediterranean headland upon which a hotel, the Hotel de la Reserve, is situated. I was a guest at the hotel. The population of the village is 743. The majority depend for their livelihoods on fishing. There are two cafes, three bistros, seven shops and a police station. One of the shops is a pharmacy. Bonjour, monsieur. I left the spool of film. Yesterday to be developed. Uh, it is not ready yet. Ah, it was promised for 11 o'clock. It is not ready yet. I see. Are you all right? Yes, monsieur. Is there a problem with the negative? No, monsieur. There is no problem. It is a question only of the drying. Ah. Uh, if you'll be good enough to give me your name and address, I will send the negative as soon as it is ready. Now, don't worry. I'll call again. There will be no trouble, monsieur. Uh, very well. It's Vadasi. V-A-D-A-S-S-Y. I am staying at the Hotel de la Reserve, but only until Sunday. It should be sent to you as soon as it is ready. Yeah. But definitely by Sunday. Yes, monsieur. Thank you. Monsieur Vadasi. Yes? I am Lieutenant Rompen of the Surete. I must ask you to accompany me to the commissariat. What on earth for? A passport formality only, monsieur. There's a problem with my passport. If you'll come with me, sir, everything will be explained. Should I get my passport from the hotel? That won't be necessary. I don't understand. You will. Allez. What? Anthony. Sir, this is the man. Joseph Badassi? Yes. Come in. I am Duval. You may go, Lieutenant. Sir. Take a seat. Thank you. Your identity card, please. Yeah. Merci. Age? 32. You are, I see, a teacher of languages. Yes. Who employs you? The Bertrand Matisse School of Languages, 114 bis Avenue Marceau, Paris, 6. And what is your business in saint gatien I am on holiday. You are a Yugoslav subject? No, Hungarian. Then how, monsieur, do you explain this? That is my passport. How did you get my passport? I left it in my hotel room. Indeed, that is where we found it. But, what? I am waiting, monsieur, for your explanation. How is it that you, a Hungarian, are using a Yugoslav passport? A Yugoslav passport, I should add, that is out of date. I 
took a moment to compose my thoughts. Then I began to give the explanation I had given a hundred times before, the explanation I knew by heart. I was born in Zabatka, in Hungary, in 1903. By the Treaty of Trianon in 1919, Zabatka became part of Yugoslavia. In 1921, I obtained a Yugoslav passport so I could enroll at the University of Budapest. While I was a student there, my father and elder brother were shot by the Yugoslav police. I had no other living relatives. I was advised not to return to Yugoslavia unless I, too, wanted to be shot. In 1922, I went to England, where I taught German in a school until 1931, when my work permit was withdrawn. Many foreigners had their work permits withdrawn by the English at that time. I then applied to have my Yugoslav passport renewed, but I was refused on the grounds that I was no longer a Yugoslav citizen. As I was not able to work in England, I went to Paris. The police gave me leave to remain there on the understanding that if I ever left France, I should not be permitted to return. I am currently awaiting the result of my application for French citizenship. What was the offence for which your father and brother were shot? They were social democrats. Hmm. You are a photographer, Monsieur Vadassi. Well, an amateur, yes. Why do you ask? How many cameras do you possess? One. What make is it? A Zeiss Contacts. Is this it? Yes. What are you doing with it? It was in your room. Well, what does it have to do with my passport? You have no other camera about this? Uh, no. Do you know what this is, Monsieur Vadassi? Yes. That is a spool of 24 by 36 millimeter exposures for the contacts camera. This is the spool which you gave to the pharmacist in the village for development. Is it? He told me he was waiting for the negatives to dry. What is your salary, Monsieur Vadassi? 1,600 francs a month. Not very much. Unfortunately, no. The contacts is an expensive camera. Well, yes, it's a very good camera. How much did you pay for it? 4,500 francs. Nearly three months' salary. Well, in my opinion, it was worth it. You seem to be able to make your 1,600 francs go a long way, Monsieur. An expensive camera... Holidays at the Hotel de la Réserve? It's the first holiday I had in five years. I saved for it. I saved for the camera, too. Uh, naturellement. Uh, monsieur, excuse me, but you are beginning to test my patience. You will please explain to me why you have taken my passport and my camera and why you have brought me to the police station. I have yet to learn that it is illegal to photograph lizards. Lizards? Yes, we have seen your lizards. Two dozen photographs of them. Don't you think that a little strange, Monsieur Vadassi? Not in the least. If you knew anything at all about photography, you would have noticed that each frame is composed slightly differently and lit slightly differently to the one before. The lizards themselves are incidental. And even if I had taken a hundred shots of lizards, I don't see that it is any business of yours. Two dozen photographs from a roll of 32. All lizards. Yes. What were the other eight photographs of, Monsieur Vadassi? The other... Was it the lighting, Monsieur Vadassi, or was it the composition that so interested you in the new fortifications outside the naval harbour at Toulon? The what? You admit to taking the photographs on this film? Yes, of course. Then please look at them and give me your explanation. I took the negative and held it up to the light. I saw lizards, only lizards. Some of the shots look quite promising. And then suddenly there it was, within the frame, a curious arrangement of shadows and highlights, some out of focus, some not. At first I could not make out what I was looking at. Then at last I understood. It was the long, sleek barrel of a siege gun. <laughs> Next case. Name? Joseph Vadassi. Who is the investigating officer? I am. Georges Duval. I am an officer of the Sûreté Générale attached to the Naval Intelligence Department at Toulon. Monsieur Vadassi, you are being charged with espionage, trespassing in a military zone, taking photographs calculated to endanger the safety of the French Republic 
and being in possession of photographs calculated to endanger the safety of the French Republic. Do you understand these charges, monsieur? Yes, of course. You'll be taken into custody while I examine the evidence. Next case. It was ridiculous. Barely two hours ago, I was on holiday and had left my hotel to collect photographs from the pharmacy, and now... I was in a police cell under arrest on a charge of espionage. Just my luck. All my life I had been dogged by misfortunes such as this. I had lost my mother to influenza, my father and brother to the firing squad, even my nationality to some botched peace treaty. It had got to the point where I had begun to suspect it wasn't luck or fate, but me. I had somehow brought it all on myself by some inscrutable flaw of character. Yes! And then it came to me. Open up! I need to speak to Monsieur Duval. Open the door! I demand! Good. You're here. Of course I'm here. What's all the noise about? It was the pharmacist. It must have been. Who else could have access to the film from my camera? Calm down, monsieur. If you are hungry, I will get you some food. No, thank you. I'm not hungry. Cigarette. Well, thanks. It could not have been the pharmacist. Well, why not? Because it was the pharmacist who alerted us to your photographs in the first place. I see. But that could have been a diversionary tactic. Good grief, it was not the pharmacist. However, I am puzzled about why you confessed so readily to having taken those photographs. Because I did take them, but only the lizards. Then how do you account for the others? I've been thinking. Perhaps the spool in my camera was changed. By whom? By whoever actually did take the photographs. And I have to say, I don't entirely rule out the pharmacist. Monsieur Vadassi, I believe you are one of three things. A very clever spy, a very stupid one, or an innocent man. I'm inclined to believe you are innocent. No guilty man would be such an imbecile. Thank you. However, it is absolutely vital that I find out who did take those photographs, and I believe this may be something you can assist us with. Then, if and when the real criminal is discovered, perhaps we can do something for you in return. Do something? What do you mean? Firstly, you should understand that the penalty, were you to be convicted of the charges laid against you, would be four years in prison, followed by deportation. My God. Monsieur Vadassi, you are a citizen of nowhere, without passport, without national status. You have no ambassador to apply to for help, no government to offer you support. You are forever at the mercy of a vast, unfeeling bureaucracy that is incapable of recognizing that you even exist. What will become of you? I don't know. Nor do I. God! Are you leaving? You have not told me what I should do. Calm down. I'm not leaving. Why do you always jump to conclusions? He's bringing me something. Do you see? Voilà, monsieur. Merci. You may go. Now, do you recognize this? Yes. It's my camera. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Of course it is. Examine it more closely. I don't need to. It is quite clearly my camera. It's lucky for you, monsieur, that French justice takes care of imbeciles as well as criminals. Here is the insurance policy for your camera, which we found in your pocketbook. It tells us that the serial number of your camera is F645232. Ah. Now, look at the serial number of the camera in your hands. F645752. This is not my camera. Bravo! That wasn't so hard, was it? Then why were my photographs on the negative? Because, my dear imbecile, it was not the films that were changed, but the cameras. When you photographed your stupid lizards, the other photographs had already been taken. You must have picked up somebody else's camera by mistake. To anyone who has only the briefest acquaintance with you, this will come as no surprise whatsoever. So you accept that I am innocent? Regrettably, I do. Then what am I doing here? You must release me immediately. The fact remains that you were found in possession of photographs calculated to endanger the safety of the Republic. That in itself is a serious offence. It would mean deportation at the very least. But I had no idea that those photographs were in my camera. I mean, 
the camera that I thought was mine. So you say, but that would be for the court to decide. But... For myself, I believe that whoever picked up your camera did so by mistake. It's easy to imagine. Two identical cameras placed in close proximity to each other. You mistake his for yours, he mistakes yours for his, or hers for that matter. The question is, firstly, where did this happen? And secondly, who has your camera now? And that is what you want me to find out for you? Correct. Well, how on earth do you expect me to do that? Bear with me, Vadassi. Let us trace your camera's journey from Paris. You packed it in your valise? Yes. Did you remove it from your valise at any time between leaving home and arriving at the Hotel de la Reserve? No. You arrived, you unpacked, you removed your camera from your valise? Yes. At some point, you left your room with your camera? Yes, on the first morning when I came down to breakfast. Uh, you took it with you to the breakfast table? Yes. Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I left it on a chair in the hallway. Ah. I picked it up after breakfast as I was leaving the hotel. To photograph lizards? Yes. Uh, well, not lizards specifically. Now, think carefully. When you picked up your camera, was it in the same position exactly as it had been when you set it down? Actually, no. Now you come to mention it, I had left it hanging on the back of a chair. When I returned, it had been moved to the seat of another chair. I didn't think anything of it at the time. You didn't check to see if your actual camera was still hanging on the back of the chair where you had left it? Well, no, of course not. I simply assumed the camera I had picked up was my actual camera. Presumably, then, the owner of the other camera arrived, found his camera missing from the seat of the chair where he had left it, then noticed yours and simply assumed it was his. Yes, that sounds plausible. Were all the other guests down to breakfast? Uh, ja, ja, I wouldn't know about all. I had only arrived the night before. Let's assume they were. Besides the staff and the owner, Frau Kirker, there are a total of ten guests. Here is a list of their names. What am I supposed to do with this? Listen to me, Vadasi. I am now going to release you on parole. You will return to the Hotel de la Reserve and act as if nothing had happened. No one will know you have been arrested. You will make discreet inquiries about who may or may not own a Zeiss contacts. I suggest you begin simply by finding out who has a camera, any camera. Are you quite serious? Believe me, my friend, if I had any alternative, I would grasp it with both hands. But... Yes? But... What? I am a language teacher... I have no experience of detective work. Monsieur Vadassi, the choice is very clear. Either you do as I asked, or you will be charged with possessing photographs calculated to endanger the safety of the Republic. Guard! Uh, wait, wait, wait. You don't understand. I am expected to start work first thing on Monday morning. It is the new term, and my employer is very particular about timekeeping. That is not my concern. The decision is yours. Yes, sir? Uh, well... All right, all right, I'll do it. Give me the list. Now, listen to me, Vadassi. You will report to me by telephone every morning. Here is my card. Call me from the post office in the village and don't get any stupid ideas. If you attempt to leave St. Gatien without my permission, you will be rearrested immediately and I shall make it my personal business to ensure that you are deported by steamer directly to Dubrovnik. You realise that that would be a death sentence for me? Absolutely. Now, wait here. You will be released shortly. It was only after Duval left that I was hit by the full horror of my predicament. It was Thursday afternoon. My employer, Monsieur Mathis, expected me to start the new term on Monday. I knew that if I was late on the first day of term, I would lose my job. And if I lost my job, it would be almost impossible for me as a resident alien to find another. At that moment, there was for me only one question in the world. Was there a train from Toulon that would get me back to Paris by Monday morning? Ah, Monsieur Vedassi. <laughs> You have returned. Uh, Frau Kerker, you wouldn't happen to have a railway timetable by any chance? Oh, of course. One moment. Here you are. Ah, thank you. Planning your escape? I beg your pardon? 
the police were here this morning. They said they had permission to take your passport. Ah, y- y- yes, that's right. I hope you don't mind. I didn't feel I could refuse their request in the circumstances. Not at all. Nothing serious, I trust. Uh, no, no. Simple misunderstanding. A question of identity which we were able to clear up very quickly. They were most apologetic. I'm glad to hear it, Monsieur Vadassi. I hope it hasn't spoilt your holiday. Oh, good grief, no. Not in the slightest. I suppose we must make allowances for such things in wartime. Thanks for the timetable, Frau Kirke. I will return it before dinner. I hurried to my room and studied the timetable. Oh, thank God. Thank God. To my immense relief, I found that there was a train from Toulon on Sunday afternoon, which reached Paris at six o'clock on Monday morning. Now all I had to do was identify the enemy spy who had secretly taken photographs of the naval installation at Toulon. I had approximately 48 hours in which to do it. Where to start? How to start? I lay back on the bed to collect my thoughts. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew it was dark outside. What? What time is it? Oh, good Lord, good Lord, that's not possible. It was after seven o'clock. I had no more time to lose. I switched on a light and studied the guest list that Duval had given me. An American couple, the Skeltons. An English couple, the Clandon Hartleys. A sprinkling of French, Mademoiselle Odette Martin, Monsieur André Roux, Monsieur Robert Duclos. Herr and Frau Vogel from Austria. The Swiss owner, Frau Kirke, a lone German. Herr Emil Schimmler of Berlin. I could put faces to the names of one or two of these people, but that was all. I had exchanged nods with them at mealtimes, no more. And yet one of them was a spy. But which one? I would have to engage each of them in conversation and tease out the required information. Now, (laughs) for most people, this would be a relatively straightforward task. Most people, it seems to me, have a facility for making small talk, for striking up casual acquaintances at the drop of a hat. I do not possess such a facility. I am nervous and awkward in company, and that, combined with a desperate wish to appear friendly, renders me either stiff and standoffish or horribly effusive. However, on this occasion, I had no choice. I picked up the railway timetable and made my way down to the lobby. For once, I would have to shed my inhibitions. I tried in advance to think of amusing things to say. On the stairs, I had my first chance to try one out. Uh, uh, The the weather is very fine this evening, wouldn't you say? What's that? Very fine, the weather. Oh, the weather. Yes, I would say the weather is always very fine in (laughs) south of France at this time of year. Indeed, quite so. I'm sorry. Would you excuse me? I promised to meet my sister in the village, and I'm, I'm running late. Of course. I'm Skelton, by the way. Warren Skelton. Joseph Vadassi. Well, uh, have a good evening, Mr. Vadassi. Uh, you too, Mr. Skelton. <laughs> this was going to be harder than I thought. It was impossible to predict how people might respond to an overture. I approached the reception counter, intending to return the railway timetable to Frau Kirke. But as I was about to ring the bell, I heard voices coming from the manager's office. One belonged to Frau Kirke herself. The other, I didn't recognize. Please, Susanna, keep trying. I am desperate. I need to know. Indeed, you must be patient. I have already waited too long. Not too loud, The other guests were here. I'm sorry, but it's just too much. I'd better be going. Calm down, Fred. You're too emotional. No, I need some air. I stepped back into the shadows and waited. After a moment, a man stepped out of Frau Kirke's office. I recognized him as one of the other guests, a rather sad little man who kept himself to himself. But for the brief instant he stood in the doorway, I saw something else, something which I had not seen since I had left Hungary, the eyes of a human being with nothing left to hope for but death to end his misery. Emil, she'd called him. There was only one Emil on the hotel guest list, the German, Emil Schimmler. 
and he'd called her Suzanne. This man was no ordinary hotel guest. What was the information he so desperately needed her to get for him? The whereabouts of his lost photographs, perhaps. I followed him into the bar. He walked through it onto the terrace and stood there, staring out to sea. I lingered for a moment. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening. What can I get you, sir? An aperitif before dinner, perhaps? Um... I had a sudden flash of inspiration. Uh, no. Thank you. While Shimla was meditating on the terrace, I would pay a visit to his room to see if my camera was there. Tell me, which is Herr Shimla's room? Do you know? Only I promised to lend him a book. Herr Shimla? Yes, Herr Shimla. Emil Shimla. I don't believe there's anyone of that name staying at the hotel, sir. Oh, really? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Quite sure, sir. Then, who is the man who just walked through the bar? Oh, you mean Herr Heinberg? Heinberger? Yes, sir. He's a friend of the manageress. I'm afraid I don't know of any Schimmler. I see. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. I must have got my wires crossed. Well, if you want to lend him a book, sir, well, he's, well, he's standing just up there, sir, as you can see. Yes, that's true. You could give it to him in person. Yes, quite. Do you know, he looks as if he'd prefer not to be disturbed at the moment. I'll catch him later. As you wish. <laughs> I barely slept a wink that night. So much had happened in the past 12 hours that the day's events churned restlessly around in my head. I must ask you to accompany me to the commissariat. I am waiting, monsieur, for your explanation. How is it that you, a Hungarian, are using a Yugoslav passport? Do you understand these charges, monsieur? Please, Susanne, keep trying. I need to know. Emil, you must be patient. I have already waited too long. It was clear to me that Paul Heinberger and Emil Schimmler were one and the same person. Why was he using a false name? What was he trying to hide? He was German and he was desperate. This must be our spy. I felt sure of it. The police needed to act quickly to prevent him from escaping. In the morning, I went straight to the post office to telephone <sighs> Duval. Post administrative. Now, could I speak to Monsieur Duval? Please tell him it's Vadasi. Hold the line. While I waited for Duval to pick up the telephone... I noticed a man staring at me through the post office window. It was Rompano, the agent de police who had arrested me at the pharmacy the day before. He nodded at me in a friendly sort of way. But I said... Uh, Monsieur Duval, am I being followed? Yes, of course you are. I told you, if you put one foot out of place, you'll be arrested uh, immediately. But everyone in the village will know I am being followed. It's absurd. How am I supposed to act discreetly with a six-foot gendarme traipsing along behind me? You'll find a way. Is this the reason you called me? <sighs> I thought I asked you to find out about the cameras. I know. But I have discovered something else. What do you mean, something else? One of the guests on your list, Emil Schimmler, is using a false name. He is calling himself Heinberger. A member of staff assured me that there is no one called Schimmler staying at the hotel, and yet I heard Frau Kirker, the manageress, calling him Emil. Do you see? Do I see what, Vadassi? Uh, Schimmler and Heinberger are one and the same person. He's using an alias. I have no doubt that this is the man you are looking for. You must arrest him immediately. Listen to me, Vadassi. You were given very clear instructions. You were told to find out which of the guests have cameras. Uh, uh, you were not asked to play detectives. Yes, but surely... Do you want to be sent back to Dubrovnik? Well, of course not. Then return to the hotel immediately. Question the guests and give me the information I require the moment you have it. Nothing else. Do you understand? Yes, but... Nothing! <sighs> well, how ridiculous... So I was to question the guests to find out which of them had cameras. The idea was at best amateurish. What if the spy had already discovered that his photographs were missing? He would know that something had gone wrong and be on his guard. 
anyone attempting to start a conversation on the subject of photography would immediately make him suspicious and he would leave the hotel. We meet again, Lieutenant. Good morning, sir. I gather you have been told to follow me. That's right, sir. Look, don't you think that's rather ill-conceived? Sir? Everyone in the village will know that you are following me and our entire operation could be put in jeopardy. I have my orders, sir. Ah, well, all right. But will you at least wait in the street while I'm inside the hotel? Of course. I was going to do that anyway. And try not to look too obvious. Perhaps sit outside the cafe and order a drink. Wait, I'll buy you a presse. No, thank you, sir, but I can buy my own presse. I can claim it on expenses, up to a certain level. Very well. It was quite absurd. Clearly, if I had to trust my fate to Duval and this clod-hopping gendarme, then my chances of getting to Paris by Monday morning were non-existent. No, I would do my own thinking, thank you very much. And Monsieur Duval would look very foolish indeed when I presented him with the evidence he needed. I quickly devised a plan. I decided to set a trap. The camera itself would be the bait. I would plant it somewhere in the hotel, somewhere conspicuous, then retreat to a place where I could see it without being seen myself. Then I would simply wait for the spy to break cover and attempt to steal it. If nothing happened, it meant that the exchange of cameras had not yet been noticed. In that case, no damage would be done. If something did happen, if someone did attempt to take the camera, then I would know beyond doubt the identity of the spy. Voila! However, I find that my enterprises never quite proceed along classical lines. As I made my way downstairs to set my trap. But Assy, I see you already have your camera. Oh, Mr. Skelton, how are you? I'm just going to get mine before it disappears. Before what disappears? Oh, I thought you knew. The yacht. Go and see. It really is quite spectacular. I'll be down in a minute. <sighs> I stepped out onto the terrace, and there, sweeping into the bay, was a large white yacht in full sail. This was my first piece of luck. It did indeed look spectacular, and set against the cobalt blue of the sea and sky, it made an excellent subject for photography. Many of the other guests had gathered on the terrace, some already with cameras in their hands. I made a mental note of who they were and what cameras they had. There was a plump, jolly-looking man with a small box camera. A woman I knew to be Mademoiselle Martin had the same type. Skelton returned from his room with an expensive Kodak. And finally, a man speaking French with a provincial accent, possibly Monsieur Duclos, arrived with an enormous hooded reflex. The only person on the terrace without a camera was Herr Schimmler, alias Heinberger who stood slightly apart from the rest, looking somewhat forlorn. A couple, who I took from their hot air to be the British Clandon Hartleys, watched through field glasses. And there was also a very attractive American woman, who I had previously noticed in the company of Skelton. This, I guessed, was Miss Mary Skelton. Isn't she a beauty? What? Oh, uh, yes, yes, a beauty. You mean the yacht? Yes, the yacht. <laughs> what did you think I meant? Guten <laughs> Tag. The, the army has signed a tolle camera. The American wollen immer das Neueste. Yeah, so is this. Uh, this gentleman is admiring your camera. Oh, you? thanks. Er bedankt sich. Yes, I understood. I also speak English. Ah. My name is Vogel. I am from Salzburg. Er bedankt sich from Paris. That is a fine camera you have there, monsieur. Nice contacts, I believe. Yes, that's right. I would like to own such a camera, but I am a married man. Zeiss is a very good make. German, of course. They use slave labor, don't they? Zeiss, that is. Well, perhaps that's what they say in the American newspapers, but I doubt. <laughs> oh, I don't. Arbeitslager, that's the word, isn't it? Forced labor. I hear they take their undesirables off the street and give them useful employment. Zeiss, Volkswagen, IG Farben, Bosch, Siemens. I would not know, sir. I am not German. I am Austrian. Guten Tag. Well, if you can't take a joke. You speak German. Not a little. You speak more. I am a language teacher. I speak a number of languages. Ah, how many? 
Altogether five. You hear that, Mary? Mr. Vadassi here speaks five languages. Five? I can barely speak one. This is my sister, Mary, yes. by the way. Thanks for the gracious introduction, Warren. She's American, as am I. You've been keeping yourself to yourself, Mr. Vadassi. It's a shame to speak all those languages and not make friends on holiday. Not everyone's a chatterbox like you, Mary. Some people like to be left alone. Would you rather be left alone, Mr. Vadassi? Not at all. In fact, I should be most grateful if you could acquaint me with the names of a few of the other guests. Mm, I'd be happy to. In fact, I could tell you almost anything about them you might care to know. Really? My sister likes to invent biographies for people based on what they look like. For example, uh, the man you were just speaking to is clearly a retired police commissioner living on the proceeds of graft. Mary? His name is Fogel, by the way. He's Austrian. Yes, he told me. At least he says he's Austrian. We seem to meet a lot of Austrians these days and very few Germans. I wonder why that is. The woman with the box camera? I believe she is Mademoiselle Martin. Uh, yes, and she is the paramour of Monsieur Rue. Mary! Come on, Warren. We've all seen them canoodling over dinner. It's not as if they're trying to hide it. And the fellow over there, he is Schimmler, yes? Schimmler? No, that's Heinberger. He's tight with the manager, asked Frau Kirk. Mary thinks they've got something going on, too. He is German, yes? He told me he was Swiss and that he writes. He's a Swiss who writes. So not German. Not according to him. I have a theory about Mr. Heinberger. <laughs> I can't wait to hear it. He's a spy. What makes you say that? Don't even try to humor her, Mr. Vassi. She needs no encouragement to slander innocent people. Come on, Mary. I want one of you with the yacht in the background. While Skelton took photographs of his photogenic sister, I watched Schindler, alias Heinberger. He seemed out of place on the beach. There was an unmistakable air of melancholy about him as if he wasn't supposed to be there and knew it. As my mind wandered, I suddenly remembered my plan and began to take photographs of the yacht in as conspicuous a manner as possible. I wanted the other guests to notice that I had a Zeiss contacts before I left it on the chair in the hallway in the exact spot where I had lost it two days before. I would be able to see it from the writing room across the hall, reflected in the mirror above the mantelpiece. But first, I would have to maneuver one of the big armchairs into position so that I would have a clear view of the camera in the mirror while remaining hidden myself. Is there anything I can help you with, Monsieur Vidassi? <sighs> Frau Kirke, I hope you don't mind. It's just that I was trying to read and the sun was in my eyes. You could pull us a blind or sit in one of the other chairs. Oh, but this one is so comfortable. <laughs> I love this chair. As you wish. Uh, shall I close the door for you? Uh, no, no. Please leave it open. Thanks. I sat in the chair and checked the view, then got up and moved the chair again. When I was quite satisfied that the chair was in the right place, I sat down and waited. I felt rather breathless and my heart was beating fast. Then I heard footsteps. Oh, someone's left a camera here. Doesn't that belong to Mr. Vadassi? Hello. It's all right. I left it there. I'm just in here reading, you see. Ah, good. I was just wondering. <laughs> Thanks. I will see you at lunch. Okay. Anyway. I sat down again. Several minutes passed. I stared at the reflection in the mirror and tried hard not to blink in case, in the fraction of a second during which my eyes were closed, the spy should appear. The effort made my eyes water. Two o'clock went by. Five past two. Ten past. My eyes were beginning to smart. There was a slight creak from somewhere behind me. I turned and looked into the hallway, but there was nothing to be seen. Then suddenly, I realized the door was closing. I leapt from the chair and hurled myself at it, but I was not quick enough. Open the door! I say, what's going on? Who's there? Open the door! This instant, open the door! Uh, Frau Kirke! I looked past Frau Kirke into the hallway. To my horror, I saw that the camera had gone. Clearly my trap had worked, but instead of the spy, it was me who had been caught in it. I had managed to lose the one piece of evidence that could prove my innocence. Are you all right, Mr. Verdassi? Yes, I... You see, I, I suffer from mild claustrophobia, and... It appears that someone shut the door and locked it. 
I don't know why, and it caused me to panic, I'm afraid. But who would do such a thing? I don't know. It's, it's very strange. To say the least. I thank you for releasing me, Frau Kirke. I didn't mean to cause a scene. Oh, not at all. Uh, you didn't happen to see who it was, by any chance. Uh, no, of course not. Otherwise, you would have I'm said... I'm afraid I simply can't account for it, Mr. Vidas. Oh, well, no harm done. If you will excuse me... Uh, of course. As casually as possible, I went out onto the terrace and looked around. I could not afford to appear as desperate as I felt. Above all, I must not let Duval know that having lost the first camera, I had now managed to lose the second one. The other guests were more or less as I had left them 20 minutes earlier. Only Schimmler, alias Heinberger, was missing. And the skeletons. Schimmler! It must be him. Schimmler, Heinberger, whoever he was. Clearly he was the guilty man, but Duval had already flatly refused to entertain the idea. There was nothing for it. I would have to take the bull by the horns and search his room as I had intended to do the day before. But first, I would need to establish exactly where he was at that moment so that he wouldn't burst in and catch me in the act. I wandered through the hotel and found him at last in the billiard room, reading a book. There you are. Were you looking for me? No. <laughs> this was my chance. I would go straight to his room. I turned to leave when it suddenly occurred to me that I didn't know his room number. I would have to engage him in conversation and somehow turn the subject towards hotel rooms. Warm, isn't it? What? The weather. He looked at me as if I was mad, then continued reading. <sighs> Out of the corner of my eye, I could see that the book was The Birth of Tragedy by Friedrich Nietzsche. This gave me an opening. Nietzsche. Mm. Hardly the companion for a hot afternoon. You are probably right, but I was not seeking companionship. Do people actually read Nietzsche these days? What do you mean? I thought he was unfashionable. Do you have any idea what you're talking about? To be honest, no. <laughs> I was merely trying to make conversation. I'm sorry. I will leave you in peace. Uh, wait a moment. Do you play billiards? Um, not very well. Oh, me neither. But I enjoy it. You start. Pick a cue. Oh, dear. I'm really not very good at this. It doesn't matter. We won't play for money. Here, why don't you take this cue... It seems to be in better condition than that one. No, you take it. No, you. I'm Heinberger, by the way. Vadasi. Ah, so you're Vadasi. What do you mean? I gather you had some trouble with the police. Oh, you heard about that, did you? Yes, there was a misunderstanding about my passport. A misunderstanding? <clears throat> uh, was quickly dealt with. Your turn, I believe. Who told you about it? Uh, Frau Kirke. What are you? Yugoslav? Hungarian, originally. Ah, the Treaty of Trianon. Indeed. My commiserations. It's you again. Tell me about Hungary. Oh, I haven't been there for years. Ten at least. You're German, aren't you? Actually, no. I'm Swiss. Are you going to take your shot? Yeah, of course. Sorry. Ah, well played, you yeah. see. You're not as bad as you think you are. I was about to say it's unusual to meet Germans outside of Germany these days. It may well be, but as I say, I am from Switzerland. Yes, of course. Ah! You're... German is very good for a Hungarian, by the way. I heard you speaking to Herr Vogel. You speak like a native. Thank you. I teach languages, you see, in Paris. Uh, I'm not giving you much of a game, I'm afraid. Nonsense, quite the contrary. Unless you prefer to play something else. No, no. Please, carry on. I enjoy playing billiards, but I have so little time for hobbies other than my principal hobby which is photography. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Do you have a camera, Herr Heinberger? Me? No. Of course he must be lying. But while we were playing, a suspicion crept into my head that this man could not by any stretch of the imagination be a spy. There was something about him that made the idea seem absurd. A certain dignity. No more than that. Besides, did spies read Nietzsche? I do hope you fellows are not playing for money. Ah, Frau Kirke, I didn't see you there. You should be careful. Herr Heimberger is something of a wizard at Russian billiards. No. <laughs> Mr. Vardasi has been very patient with me. The game holds no interest for him. Uh, no, honestly, I've enjoyed it. But I really should be going. I want to run into the village to buy some souvenirs. Why don't you join us later for ping pong? I'm going to sit at the table outside on the terrace. Thank you. I will. As I walked away, I felt that both of them were watching and waiting until I was out of earshot before starting a conversation of their own. A continuation of the conversation I had overheard the night before. I longed to hear what they said to each other, but I could not risk trying to eavesdrop. It was time to deliver my report to Monsieur Duval. I crossed the road to the post office, greeting Lieutenant Rompano as I passed the cafe. Bonjour, Lieutenant Rompano. Bonjour, Monsieur Vadassi. Well, Vadassi, do you have something to tell me? You wanted to know about cameras. Yes. Well then, Herr Virgil has a Voicelander box type. His wife has an obsolete Kodak retina. Monsieur... Vadassi, I don't need to know the make and model of each camera. Just tell me who has one. If it was a Zeiss contact, I'm sure you'd like to know the make and model. Of course I would. Have you found it? No. Then why do you mention it? In addition to Herr Vogel and his wife, Frau Kirke and Monsieur Duclos both have cameras. Also Mademoiselle Martin. Good. And the others? The man called either Heinberger or Schindler says he doesn't own one. The English couple don't appear to either, nor does Monsieur Roux. Have you anything else to report? Uh, no. I have nothing else to report. You don't sound very sure. I am sure. All right, telephone me again first thing in the morning. Goodbye. I walked back to the hotel with a heart as heavy as lead. I could not tell him I had lost the second Zeiss contacts. I would have to get it back somehow, but I couldn't even be sure who had taken it. Ça va, Monsieur Vadassi? Ça va, Lieutenant Rompano. I went to my room and sat on the bed, staring into space. I thought I could perhaps swim out to the big white yacht anchored in the bay and stow away until it reached the next major port. My gaze had been resting unfocused on my valise, while various other fanciful escape plans formed and turned to dust in my mind. But for one small detail, I should probably not have noticed anything out of the ordinary. Both latches of my valise were fastened. It was my unchanging habit when staying at a hotel to fasten only one. Perhaps the chambermaid had fastened the other when tidying up, but then panic gripped my body and I tore the valise open as I remembered I had left two undeveloped rolls of film in it. Sure enough, they were gone. Nick, wait! You nincompoop! Nothing, nothing could have demonstrated more clearly the utter futility of my existence. I looked at myself in the mirror and spoke out loud. Now get this into your head, you pathetic ninny. This man or this woman who took photographs of the naval fortifications at Toulon, who stole your precious camera, who locked you in the writing room like the helpless noodle you are, who snatched the camera you idiotically left as bait, then broke into your room and took your undeveloped rolls of film. This person has shown you up as the incompetent buffoon that you are and always have been. It's time to be a man, Vadasi. This is not a dream. This is your life. I walked to the window in search of inspiration and stared down at the terrace. The skeletons were sitting at a table in animated conversation. Mary Skelton threw her head back to laugh at one of her brother's droll remarks. There was humor and intelligence in her eyes. 
while the thick mass of her fair hair gleamed in a most interesting way. I wondered what Mary Skelton thought of me. Nothing, probably. Or if she did think anything, it was no doubt that I was a polite, inoffensive young man with a gift for languages. Yes, it must be exceedingly pleasant to have Mary Skelton interested in you. She glanced up and caught me looking at her. I restrained the impulse to step back from the window and smiled weakly down at her instead. She smiled back and beckoned to me, raising a glass and pointing at it. I waved and nodded, and obediently began to make my way downstairs. Cheers! Plus, santé. <laughs> so, have you been staying here for long, Mr. Skelton? Mm. About a week. Our parents are coming from the States to join us in a few days. We're meeting them at Marseille. And you arrived here Tuesday, didn't you, Mr. Vadassi? Yes. Well, I'm glad we can talk to someone in English. The Britisher and his wife? They're not too friendly. Colonel Clandon Hartley. Have you met him? No. He probably thinks Americans are savages. <laughs> we speak a little French, but the trouble with French is they get mad if you can't speak their language perfectly. <sighs> have you noticed that? The way they taught when you mispronounce a single word. It's because the French love the sound of their language. To them, a bad French accent is like an out-of-tune violin, painful to the ears. Well, I didn't think my accent was as bad as all that. <laughs> I'm sure it's very good, Miss Skelton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention for a moment? The staff are putting up the ping-pong table under the trees. I invite you all to join us in the tournament. What does the winner get? Their bill paid? Definitely <laughs> <laughs> no. Just the pride of victory over such formidable opposition as you see before you. Uh, I will leave you to organize yourselves. Monsieur Skelton, L.A., I want my revenge. Okay, I'm coming. Yesterday I skinned him. I could tell he didn't like it. Guy's a sore loser. <laughs> I don't like that man. Monsieur Roux, why not? His suit's too tight, and he puts too much oil in his hair. Is that such a good reason to dislike someone? <gasps> Always judge a person by their appearance, Monsieur Vadassi. Anyone who tells you different is a fool. Hmm. Miss Skelton, you did not tell me why you thought Herr Heinberger was a spy. Heinberger? Uh, I expect I was being facile. He has an air of mystery about him, is all. No other reason? No. Why are you so interested? Oh, I'm not, really. Well, you certainly seem to be. Are you a spy, Mr. Vadassi? Uh, me? No. I don't suppose you'd tell me if you were. Spies don't exactly advertise, do they? It was true. You couldn't expect a spy to look like a spy, however a spy was supposed to look. <laughs> at that moment, spies were at work all over Europe. The world was getting ready to go to war. For spies... Business was good. Ah! No, 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 no. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Uh-oh, someone's not, not happy. Hey, look, it's yeah. okay. It's fine. Mr. Rue is one. Fair and square. Oh, this old booby. How dare you? This interfering fool. Who asked for your opinion? Uh, nobody. Who appointed you to be umpire of this game? Nobody but yourself. You are a cheat, monsieur. Someone should say so. Now, look. Look, there is no point discussing anything with this ancient imbecile. You added five points to your score. I was counting. Liar. I did not. Yes, you did. Ah, species of monkey. Ah, what? Ah, you hey, 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 come on. Monsieur, monsieur, civil pig. Isn't there already enough fighting and subvert? He will not have the war here in the Hotel de la Reserve. We are here to have a holiday. Bien. The dinner is so Saved by the bell. What happened? An old so-and-so with a white beard. Herr Fogel? He's a menace. I was doing my level best to lose to the French guy, and I was getting on pretty well until Fogel decided to keep score. It was me who added the five-point to Rue's score, not Rue. Oh. I didn't expect it to turn into an international incident. <laughs> oh, come on, Mary. Let's see. We'll see you later, Mr. Vidal. Yes. Bon appétit. After dinner, I wandered through the dunes to the beach and stared at the yacht anchored in the bay. Once again, I contemplated escape. Then I stopped in my tracks. Sitting on the sand a few yards in front of me were the skeletons. Something prevented me from going any further. They were sitting close to each other, 
he with his legs stretched out in front of him, she with hers pulled up. Unusually close for a brother and sister gazing at the moonlit sea. And then she lay her head on his shoulder, and he turned and kissed the top of her head. Unusually intimate for a brother and sister. I felt suddenly like an intruder and moved away, back towards the hotel. What had I just witnessed? Was it anything or nothing? As so often, I found it hard to interpret the behavior of other people and suspected that it was my understanding that was at fault rather than their actions. Yes, probably it was nothing at all. I was back on the terrace. The ping-pong table was deserted. The bats lay crossed with a dented ball in between the handles. I picked it up. <laughs> ah, for goodness sake! As I bent to pick up the ball, I heard a step behind me. I went to turn. The next moment, something hit me hard on the back of my head. Ah! And I lost consciousness. In part one of Eric Ambler's Epitaph for a Spy, dramatized by Nick Perry, Joseph Fadassi is played by Edward Hogg, Duval by Tony Turner, Emil Schimmler by Mark Edel Hunt, and Frau Kirker by Claire Corbett. Lieutenant Rompeneau is played by Don Gillet, Warren Skelton by Joseph Eyre, Mary Skelton, Franchi Webb, Herr Vogel by Sam Dale, and Monsieur Roux by Christopher Harper. The director is Sasha Yevtushenko. Epitaph for a Spy by Eric Ambler Adapted by Nick Perry I was out only for a few seconds and as I came round I realized that I was lying face down on the ground and something, someone was pinning my shoulders down and I could hear the sound of their breathing and feel their hands fumbling in my pockets. But before I had a chance to react, it was over. The pressure on my shoulders relaxed, a shoe grated on the path, and there was silence. After a few minutes, it may have been longer, I noticed my wallet was lying on the ground in front of me, open. But when I checked, nothing had been taken. I got to my feet and gained my room without assistance and thankfully without meeting anyone. Once I closed the door, I sank onto the bed and must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew it was morning and I had a lump the size of a duck egg on the back of my head. Bonjour, Monsieur Vidassi. You look a bit worse for wear this morning. You all right? Yes, fine. Thank you, Rumpano. That's a bit of a hangover. A hangover, eh? Drowning your troubles, were you? Vidassi? What do you have to report? Well, I don't suppose you'll think it important. But last night I was knocked down by someone on the hotel terrace. What? I was not... I heard what you said. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Who was it? Did you see? No. I was struck from behind. I think by a man. He knelt on my back and searched my pockets. Did he take anything? Nothing. What about your wallet? He left it. However... Yes? My room was broken into and two rolls of film were taken from my valise. Where did this happen? As I said yesterday... At what time? Uh, late in the evening. Around midnight, I think. My head is still very sore. What was on the film? More lizards? No. Various pictures of Nice, as a matter of fact. I was rather looking forward to seeing them. And that was all he took? Yes. What about the camera? Of course, what I should have said was, no, monsieur, he didn't take the camera, because he'd already taken the camera the day before when my ingenious plan to trap him had backfired. But I didn't, because it would have led to my immediate deportation. And so I said, the camera is in the hotel safe. Have you told anyone else about this? No. 
Good. All right. Listen carefully, Vadasi. You are to go straight back to the hotel and speak to Frau Kirker. Tell her that your suitcase has been forced open and several items have been stolen. But it hasn't been forced open. Then force it yourself. Make it look convincing. I see. But what items should I say have been stolen? Oh, for goodness sake, man. Use your imagination. All right. A uh, silver cigarette case, uh, a diamond pin, a gold watch chain, and finally the two rolls of film. Have you got that? I think so. And make a fuss. Tell the other guests, complain. I want everyone at the hotel to know about it. But whatever you do, don't ask for the police. But how... Don't argue. Do exactly as I've told you, and understand this. You are to bring up the question of the films only as an afterthought. You are concerned principally about the valuables. Is that clear? Yes. Uh, but I have no cigarette case or diamond pin or gold watch chain. Of course you haven't. They've been stolen. You know, I'm really not sure if this is such a good idea. Just get on with it, Fadassi. And what if I refuse? You cannot force me to... <sighs> That looks like a nasty bump on the back of your head, Monsieur Vadassi. You know, you really shouldn't drink so much if that's what it does to you. Thanks, Rompano. I'll bear that in mind. Disregarding Duval's instructions, the previous day had done me no favours. Whatever I thought of his latest harebrained scheme, I would be well advised to follow it to the letter. If anything went wrong, as it surely would, at least it wouldn't be my fault. I went up to my room and set to work. I got out my suitcase and locked it. Then I looked around for something to force the latches with. I tried first with a pair of nail scissors. But they snapped. I then tried with the barrel of my fountain pen, but that broke too. Finally, I used my room key to jemmy the lock open, and it worked. But the key became bent in the process, and I had to waste valuable time trying to straighten it. When I was satisfied with the appearance of my fake crime scene, I hurried down to the hotel lobby. Yes? Ah, Frau Kirke, may I have a word? It's rather urgent. Whatever is the matter, Monsieur Vadassi? I was in the village just now. Mm -hmm. When I returned to my room, I found that my suitcase had been broken open and several valuable items taken from it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, sir, please show me. We must go to your room immediately. I've only gone for an hour. Yes, I was in the post office making a telephone call. Oh, I see. Oh, dear. What a mess. Mm. What's missing? Uh, a silver cigarette case, a diamond pin, and a gold watch chain. Oh, uh, and two rolls of film, although I'm less concerned about them. Uh, what time did you leave your room this morning? I went down for breakfast at about nine. Uh, it's now uh, 11.20. Uh, how long ago did you return? About ten minutes ago. As soon as I saw what had happened, I came straight to you. Yeah. I must say, it's a shock. One does not expect this kind of thing to happen when one is on holiday. Oh, of course, of course. I can only apologise for the upset. Well, yes. Um, would you mind coming down to my office, monsieur? Oh. I should like to take a detailed description of the missing objects. Oh, of course. So far, so good. I began to feel more confident about Duval's plan and decided to adopt a more assertive tone. I must warn you, Frau Kirker, that I shall hold your establishment responsible for this incident and that I shall expect the immediate return of my valuables and the punishment of the thief. Oh, monsieur, rest assured, I will make every effort to return your property to you as quickly as possible. Well, I am glad to hear it. Please come. Now take a seat. Now, monsieur, the cigarette case first, if you please. It is, I think you said, uh, a gold one. At that moment, I froze. Her pen was poised to write. Had I said gold? For the life of me, I couldn't remember. Monsieur? Then I had an inspiration. It has a gold lining. The case itself is machined silver. Mm -hmm. It has my initials engraved on it, J.V. 
It holds ten cigarettes, and the elastic is missing. <laughs> and the chain? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eighteen carat gold. Mm -hmm. It has a small medallion on it commemorating the Brussels exhibition of 1901. 1901. Uh, and now the pin, monsieur? Uh, uh, the pin, yes. Uh, 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 just a pin. Really? Uh, uh, a tie pin about six centimetres long with uh, a small diamond in the head. And uh, finally, it's rolls of film. Yes. Two rolls of contacts film. You have a contacts camera? I do. Is it safe, monsieur? A thief will get a good price for a camera of that quality. Well, do you know, I... It didn't occur to me to check. I was in such a state of confusion... May I suggest that we go back to your room to look for it? If you wish. Hmm. Please. I knew, of course, that the camera would not be there. I prepared myself to feign shock and dismay. Ah, it's gone. I left it in this drawer. It's as you feared, Frau Kirker. But isn't that it, sir? What? Just there, monsieur, beside the bed. Well, I nearly fell over. Oh. There on the bedside table was a contacts camera complete with case. Oh, yes, yes, that's... Uh, what on earth is it doing there? I was sure I'd left it in the drawer. I don't remember putting it there. <laughs> Anyway, thank goodness. What a relief. Let's hope that everything else reappears as quickly. Yes, let's hope so. Shall we return to my office? Uh, let me just check the serial number. Yes. It's my camera, all right. Did you have any reason to think it wouldn't be? Uh, no. Uh, but one can never be too careful. Uh, please, lead on. This was, to say the least, an unexpected development. I could only assume that, having got his own camera back, the spy had decided to return mine, which was very decent of him. At least now I had one less thing to worry about. Now, then, uh, let us turn to the value of the stolen items. Firstly, the cigarette case and the watch chain. About 800 for the case and 500 for the chain. But I'm only guessing. They were gifts, you see. The pin is of sentimental value only. As for the films, <laughs> well, I should be sorry to lose them, but... Um, the cigarette case and the chain, were they insured? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid not. You will appreciate, monsieur, that in the first instance, suspicion is bound to fall on the servants. Yes, it's unfortunate. I shall question them immediately. In the meantime, could I suggest that we delay calling in the police? Of course. You will appreciate that considerable damage is done to the reputation of a small hotel by incidents such as this. I would also be most grateful if you would say nothing about it to the other guests. You have my word. Thank you. I will report to you as the moment I have completed my inquiries. And now it was time to put into action the second part of Duval's instructions. Make a fuss. Complain. Tell the other guests. I wandered down to the terrace. Oh, good morning, Mr. Badassi. Good morning. Do you mind if I join you? Of course. Please do. How are you this morning? Well, to be perfectly honest, I'm in something of a quandary. You see, may I depend upon your absolute discretion? Yes, yes of course. Yes. My room has been broken into and several items of value have been stolen. No, how awful. That's terrible. Have you called the police? Therein lies my dilemma. Frau Kirke is going to investigate, but she has requested that I refrain from involving the police at this stage. Well, theft is without doubt a matter for the police. You should call them immediately. Out of respect for Frau Kirke, I feel that I should at least give her the chance to resolve the matter herself. But, um... When did this happen? This morning. When I was at the post office, I came back and found that my valise had been forced open. Oh, and what was taken? A cigarette case, a tie pin, and a gold chain. To what value? Oh, several thousand francs. Oh, it'll be one of the chambermaids. It always is. Why do you say that? It could be anyone. It'll be the maids. Maybe Frau Kirker doesn't pay them too well. I must say, this is a most unsatisfactory situation. A thief is operating in this hotel, and the police are not being informed? 
I must warn the other guests. Dolal would be happy when I told him. I had complained. I had made a fuss. I had put the cat among the pigeons. To what end? I had no idea. I noticed Shimla, alias Heimberger, listening to what Fogel was saying to the other guests and quietly slipping away. I decided to see where he was going. I followed him into the hotel lobby and saw him enter Frau Kirker's office. After a few minutes, he came out. I stood at the end of the corridor and pretended to read the fire regulations. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him entering a room on the ground floor. I walked past it. Room 14. At least now I knew his room number. After lunch, I was summoned to see Frau Kirker. Come in. Ah, oh, yes, Monsieur Verdassi. Please take a seat. I hope, my Nadama, that you have some good news for me. I am very much afraid, monsieur, that my inquiries have yielded no result whatsoever. Oh. You see, I have examined every member of my staff, including the waiters and the gardener. They have all been with me for many years, and frankly, monsieur, I believe them when they say that they have no knowledge of this theft whatsoever. You mean that it must have been one of the guests? No, monsieur, I do not mean that. Then someone from outside? Nor anyone from outside. To be honest, I have lost interest. I think you should call the police. The police? Mm -hmm. But surely that's the last thing you want me to do. Didn't you say so yourself? Think of the damage to your reputation. Unfortunately, the damage is already done. I gather that my guests are fully apprised of the affair. Well, sorry to hear that. Are you? But, monsieur, it was you who told them. Me? Yes, you. Who else? After I'd asked you to exercise discretion. Indeed, after you'd agreed to do so, you went and openly discussed the affair with your fellow guests. I would hardly say openly. I may have spoken in confidence to one or two, but I distinctly remember asking them not to say anything to anyone else. You gave me your word. And they gave me theirs. No matter. Here is the telephone. You will no doubt wish to call the police yourself. Hmm? You seem in no hurry to pick it up. For my part, I see no need to call them. I had a feeling that you wouldn't. I'm not sure that I understand you. I've been in the hotel profession for a number of years, monsieur. You will not, I hope, think it impolite of me to say that I've encountered gentlemen of your persuasion before. What on earth do you mean? Allow me to explain. When you reported this alleged theft, you told me that you had lost a cigarette case. A little later, when I suggested to you that you had described it as a gold case, you hesitated. Then got out of your difficulties by saying that it was both gold and silver. A little too ingenious, monsieur. And something else. When we were in your room, I noticed the blade of a pair of scissors lying on the floor beside the suitcase. The other blade was on the bed. You looked at them twice, but said nothing. Why not? They might have been used to force the case, but you ignored them. You ignored them because you already knew how the case had been forced. You had done it yourself. But that's ridiculous. Why would I do a thing like that? For money, I would imagine. Money? But that's an outrageous suggestion. Your method is somewhat unorthodox, I must admit. Usually the injured party threatens to call the police unless compensation is paid. But you've gone about it back to front. Perhaps you knew it's this game, or completely incompetent. Well, if you're going to stoop to insults... Oh, trust me, I haven't started. I had my suspicions about you from the moment the police took you in for questioning. That flim-flam about your passport, I didn't believe that for one instant. And the gendarme sitting in the cafe across the road? I expect he's been put there to keep an eye on you, hasn't he? My barman mentioned you'd taken an unusual interest in another guest's room number, <sighs> making up some cock and bull story about wanting to lend him a book. I did no such thing. My stuff, don't lie. You're not the first man to try and take advantage of a widow, but really, you should be ashamed of yourself, monsieur. I should, of course, hand you straight over to the police, or at least tell you to clear out within the hour. However, both of these actions would arouse further comment among the guests, so you will leave this hotel first thing tomorrow morning. Do you understand? Perfectly. I had, in any case, no intention of remaining here after your fantastic accusations. Good. Here's your bill. 
You'd like me to settle it now, I suppose? Yes, in cash. Let me examine it. You will find everything in order. Yeah. I would like a receipt, if you would be so kind. As soon as you've paid me. There. Thank you. And there's your receipt. Thank you. I regret that I cannot say I hope to see you here again in the future. So I would just say goodbye. Goodbye. By the time I got up to my room, I was shaking from head to foot. What confronted me when I opened the door only added insult to injury. Good God. The towels, the fruit bowl, and every other portable object in the room, including the bedclothes, had been removed. This humiliation was all the fault of that idiot Duval. And to what purpose? We were no closer to finding the spy than we had been two days ago. There was nothing for it but to throw caution to the winds and attempt to search the other guests' rooms. I would start with my prime suspect, Herr Schimmler, alias Heinberger. At least I now had his room number. But I would have to be careful. I knew from the events of the night before that he was a dangerous man. He had struck me on the back of the skull with considerable force. If, indeed, it had been him. As I approached room 14, I hesitated. It is easy to contemplate searching someone else's room, but when it comes to it, opening the door and intruding upon another person's private life seems as inexcusable as spying on a pair of lovers. There was only one way to do this. I would barge into the room, and if anyone was inside, or if anyone saw me, I would say that I'd made a mistake and that it was the wrong room. I'm so sorry. I thought it was the bathroom. <laughs> oh, no, that, uh, I'm so sorry. I thought it was the bathroom. Fine. I took a deep breath. The door was unlocked. The room was empty. For the moment, I was safe. I glanced around. I could see no suitcase. I tried all the drawers, but they were empty, save for a few pairs of threadbare socks. I opened the wardrobe. Inside, there was one limp suit and a raincoat. I took the suit down and went through the pockets. In the breast pocket, I found two passports, one German and one Czech. Now this was interesting. The German one had been issued to Emil Schimmler, a journalist from Essen. Aha! It contained a number of visas for France, for Switzerland, for the Soviet Union. The Czech passport contained the same photograph of Schimmler, but it had been issued in the name of Pavel Chissa, a salesman from Brno. Interesting. In fact, I was so engrossed that I didn't hear the footsteps until they were practically outside the door. I just had time to stuff the passports back into the breast pocket before the door swung open and Schimmler walked in. I'm afraid you will find nothing of value in here. I'm so sorry. I thought this was the bathroom. Believe me, you have my sympathy. <laughs> Persons in your profession must of necessity take risks. How annoying to find that you have done so for nothing. Now, would you prefer to see the manager as here or in her office? I do not wish to see her at all. I have not taken anything. Of course, but I must remind you that you are in my room uninvited. As a matter of fact... I find that when a person begins a sentence with as a matter of fact, what follows is nearly always a lie. But do go on. What is this fact, the matter of which you wish to convey to me? Look... What I'm trying to explain is that earlier today some valuables were stolen from my suitcase. I suspected you of having taken them. Me? Yes. And clearly I was mistaken. I was annoyed because I had complained to Frau Kirke and she didn't seem to be taking my complaint seriously and so I decided to take the matter into my own hands, which I now freely admit was wrong. Unfortunately for you, I happen to have discussed with Frau Kirke what happened earlier today. Your bill is paid, I believe. I am leaving under protest. And this is part of your protest, I suppose? In a way, yes. But, as I said, I see that I was mistaken. Fortunately, no harm has been done, 
I can only apologize to you most humbly and sincerely, and if you will allow me, I will withdraw. I will not. Stay where you are. You haven't told me why you suspected me of having broken into your room, if indeed it was broken into. It was. Very well, but why me? No particular reason, just a general suspicion. Oh, absolute nonsense. You were looking at my passports when I came in just now, weren't you? Well, I might have... Who are you? What's your name? Who sent you? I'm sorry. Oh, I... Stop I... lying! Who the hell are you? You know who I am. I'm Joseph Fatassi. Oh. I'm sorry, but this is my only suit, and you're going to tear the lining. Please, please loosen your grip. Thank you. You're lucky I don't break your neck. Well, yes. I know what you're capable of. I have a lump the size of a duck egg on the back of my head, and you've just banged it again, thanks very much. I can assure you I haven't the least idea what you're talking about. No, of course you haven't. If you only knew half the trouble you'd caused me in the past two days, you would be far more sympathetic. Do you know they threatened to deport me if I couldn't find the camera? What camera? You know very well what camera. And by the way, if you haven't already spoiled those two rolls of film, I should like them back before the police arrive. Film for the contacts is not cheap, as you well know. Precisely how would I know? Oh, this is tiresome and frankly childish. Look, if this is meant to be some sort of trap, then you're going to have to make it much simpler to understand. Who are you working for? All right. You will no doubt be familiar with the name Duval. No. Then you soon will be. He is an officer of the Sûreté Générale attached to the Naval Intelligence Department at Toulon. Now do you understand? I am beginning to entertain a suspicion, Vadasi, that uh, you and I are talking at cross purposes. No, I don't think so. Just tell me what you've done with the undeveloped films, and then perhaps we can come to some mutually beneficial agreement. But I see. What undeveloped films? Very well. Have it your way. You leave me no choice but to call the police. Or perhaps you should. Or perhaps I will. What are you waiting for? Well, I, too, am beginning to think... I may have made a mistake. Tell me, who do you think I am? A spy. A German spy. Bizarre. No more bizarre, surely, than pretending to be Swiss, using an alias and carrying false passports. Oh, my reasons for doing those things have nothing to do with spying, I can assure you. Well, it's hardly normal behavior, is it? You can't blame me for being suspicious. All right, look. Oh, perhaps if... I explain. I wish you would. My real name is Schimmler. Emil Schimmler. I'm a journalist. Six years ago, in 1933, I was the editor of a social democrat newspaper in Berlin. The Telegraph Blatt. I see. As ridiculous as it sounds... At the time, the Social Democrats thought that you could meet brute force with goodwill and reason. As if the way to handle a rabid dog was to put out your hand and stroke it. After Hitler became Chancellor, the brown shirts wrecked our print room with hand grenades. Yeah. I was arrested and sent to a concentration camp near Hanover. I was there for two years, and then one day I was told that if I renounced my German citizenship, I would be set free. Of course, I signed the paper straight away. Before I left, another prisoner gave me an address in Prague. It turned out to be the headquarters of the German communist underground. I began working for them, principally on getting news into Germany, real news. We produced a newspaper printed on very thin India paper, which could be folded and carried in the palm of your hand. <sighs> Eventually, our network was compromised, and I fled to Switzerland. I... I then got a letter from Prague warning me that the Gestapo had found out that my real name was Schimmler. And I've been on the run ever since. I came here because Frau Kirke is sympathetic to the cause. Her husband was killed while working for the underground. I don't understand. You were already living in Switzerland. Why is it so bad if the Gestapo knew that your name was Schimmler? My wife and child are still in Germany. I've heard nothing from them for over four months. I don't know if their letters are being intercepted 
or if mine are, or, or um, if they've been sent to a camp, or worse. Frau Kirche goes into Nice once a week to see if there are any messages for me. I can do nothing but wait. Oh, but the waiting is killing me. It's getting to the point where I will have no choice but to go back to Germany, even though I know that's exactly what the Gestapo want me to do. I will be walking to my death. And what choice do I have? Now, do you understand, Vadasi? Yes. Can I trust you? Of course. What about this spy of yours? <laughs> I shall look for him elsewhere, Herr Heinberger. Hmm. We stood for a moment, and then I left. As I pulled the door closed behind me, I saw him slowly raise his hands to his face. I went quickly. Back in my own room, I took out Duval's list of hotel guests and crossed out two names. Frau Kirker and Emil Schimmler. It was five o'clock. They were the first two names I had crossed off the list and now I had just eight hours to investigate the others. The Fogels, Monsieur Roux and Mademoiselle Martin, the Clandon Hartleys, Duclos, the Skeltons. The Skeltons. Mary and Warren. What did I really know about them? Only what they had told me, which of course meant they could be lying. I remembered the scene on the beach, the fond caresses. Would a brother and sister really behave like that? Well, I wouldn't find out by staying in my room and dreaming. I wandered down to the hotel terrace. Mr. Benassi! Ah. Have the police been called? The police? Ah, uh, no. Fortunately, they were not needed after all. Ah, your valuables have been found? Well, yes. I'm pleased to say they have. Ah. And was it one of the servants? No, it was not. As a matter of fact, it turned out that my valuables hadn't been stolen in the first place. It's all been a rather stupid mistake on my part, I'm sorry to say. A mistake? Yes. You see, um, the chambermaid moved the small box containing the valuables while she was cleaning the room. Yeah. And when I didn't find it where I expected to find it, I, ate, I rather foolishly jumped to the wrong conclusion. I see. Yes. So... There we have it. Much ado about nothing. But couldn't the chambermaid have stolen the valuables and then panicked and put them back where she'd found them? Well, yes. I suppose that's possible, but it seems rather unlikely. In any case, I'm happy to have my valuables returned and all is as it should be. Would you excuse me? Miss Kelton, have you heard the news? Mr. Vanassi's valuables were not stolen, after all. Not stolen? Yes, that's right. <laughs> As I have just been explaining to Herr Fogel, it's all been a terrible misunderstanding. Warren, did you hear that? Mr. Vanassi said his valuables weren't stolen after all. What? Not stolen? Uh, <laughs> that is indeed correct. My items were mislaid, not stolen. I must apologize for causing so much unnecessary concern. I am deeply embarrassed. But I don't understand. What made you think they had been stolen? You know, I, I really... I actually... The fact of the matter is, I fell over. You fell over? In the bathroom. I slipped and hit my head on something. See? Here, the bump. Oh, my God. Size of a duck egg. I think I experienced the concussion. In any case, I became confused and... Have you had a doctor take a look at that? Oh, uh, no. There is no need. Please. I didn't mention it before because I didn't want to cause a fuss. But really, Mr. Vadassi, you should at least put some ice on that. Yes, ice. I will get ice from the bar. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Yes, sir? <sighs> Whiskey, please. You will pay now. Five francs. Of course. Uh, please put Monsieur Vadassi's drink on my bill. Certainly, sir. Oh, that's really not necessary. Oh, me, I... I am Rue. I don't believe we've been properly introduced. Well, I'm very grateful to you, Monsieur Rue, but... No, uh... I couldn't help overhearing what you were saying to the other guests just now. It's a, a strange story, if I may say so. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, well, my own stupid fault, I'm afraid. May I ask, why did you come here, Monsieur? To saint Gatien. Here? To this hotel? For a holiday. You have enjoyed your stay? Very much. When do you expect to leave? 
Ah, uh, I haven't decided. Why do you ask? I'm curious. Uh, it's my vice to be curious. I'm also curious about this Heinberger. Heinberger? Yes. Why does he always sit by himself? Why does he never swim? Huh. What do you think? I really have no idea. I saw you talking to him yesterday in the billiard room. Briefly, yes. I think he's Swiss, but I'm not sure. I don't like to pry. Oh, I do. I like to find out about people when I talk to them. I like to discover the difference between what people say and what they think. And is there always a difference? Of course. All men lie. They cannot bear facts, especially facts about themselves. They exist in a fog of untruth and self-deception. What a terribly fatiguing point of view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, it's entertaining. People fascinate me. You, for instance, a Hungarian with a Yugoslav passport. How do you know that? Frau Kirker told Herr Vogel. Vogel told me. Now, why, I ask, does a Hungarian with a Yugoslav passport live in France? And what is this mysterious little trip he makes every morning to the post office? You're very observant. I go to the post office to telephone my fiancé. You didn't bring her with you? Obviously not. What is her name? Ermintrude. Delightful. Well, I expect you're glad you didn't bring Mademoiselle Ermintrude with you after your encounter with the police. Everyone seems to have heard about that. Frau Kirker again, I imagine. What was the nature of their interest in you? They didn't seem to like my passport. Your Yugoslav passport? Yes. I forgot to renew it. Then how did you get into the country? I was already here when it expired. You have more questions than the police themselves, monsieur. <laughs> I told you, my curiosity is boundless. It has taught me that as well as a propensity to lie, men share one other universal characteristic. Can you guess what it is? No. A love of money. Do you agree? Up to a point. Men rarely refuse an opportunity of acquiring it. For example... I could ask you what day it is today, and you would answer... Today? It's Saturday. Ah, but it isn't. It's Friday. Yeah, I, I only wish it was, Monsieur Roux, but it's not. It's Saturday. I should be prepared to bet you 5,000 francs that today is Friday. 5,000 francs, Monsieur. Then you would lose. And you would be 5,000 francs to the good. However... I have one condition for placing such a bet. I believe you possess a certain piece of information that would be of great value to me. I can't think what information I could give you, monsieur, that would compensate you for the loss of 5,000 francs. You're quite sure? Yes. In any case, I never bet on certainties. It doesn't seem quite the thing. Barman? Yes? I will pay for my own drink. Ten francs. Keep the change. Now, if you will excuse me. I had to find Schimmler right away. I had to warn him about Roux. His interest in my new friend was most disturbing. He had seen me talking to Schimmler, he said. He obviously thought I was in Schimmler's confidence and was prepared to buy evidence of Schimmler's real identity. Heinberg. What is it, Vadasi? I have just had the most peculiar conversation with Monsieur Roux. Apparently, he saw us speaking together. He asked me a number of questions about you. Really? What sort of questions? Oh, innocent enough on the face of it. Why does he sit by himself? Why does he never swim in the sea? And did you answer? I hope I put him off the scent. But I wondered if you ought to be concerned. Thank you, Vadassi. Monsieur Vadassi, telephone call from Paris. From Paris? For me? Yes, it's in the lobby. Uh, thank you. Excuse me. Hello? Vedassi, why haven't you called me? Oh, it's you. The waiter said it was a call from Paris. Yes, that's what I told him to say. Do you have any news? No, except that I am leaving the Hotel de la Reserve tomorrow morning. You most certainly are not. You will leave when I give you permission to leave. Ah, but I have been told to leave by Frau Kirker. What? Why? Because of your idiotic plan. I told you it wouldn't work. 
Thanks to you, I have been utterly humiliated. Messed it up, did you? I might have known. I didn't mess anything up. It was a stupid idea in the first place. Yes, well, you may be right about that, Potassi. Anyway, that'll be all for now. But what do you want me to do? Stand by. You'll receive further instructions in due course. <sighs> Goodbye. Ah. And so I waited. In the evening, after dinner, the guests congregated, as usual, on the terrace. Oh, Mr. Potassi, do you mind if we join you? Of course. Not at all. Mm. How's that bump doing? Looked pretty nasty to me. That's nothing to worry about, thank you. Tell me, when did you say your parents were arriving? Our parents? Oh, yes, our parents. <laughs> Have I said something funny? No, no, not at all. Oh, come on, Warren. There's no reason why we shouldn't tell Mr. Badassi. I'm tired of this play acting. Mary, we agree. Mr. Badassi won't mind. And the fact is, we're not brother and sister. We're husband and wife. Really? Yes. You see, we're not supposed to get married for another two years, because if Warren gets married before his 25th birthday, then we'll lose $50,000 from his grandfather's will. Which would be crazy, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And we didn't want to wait that long, so... Hey, looks like Fogel said one over the eight again. Uh -oh. Herr Fogel was walking <laughs> unsteadily towards the piano in the conservatory. He raised the lid over the keys and sat down heavily on the piano stool. And after a few seconds, he began to play a Chopin nocturne. In six hours, my train would leave for Paris. I was no closer to identifying the spy than I had been three days ago. It was hopeless. I looked around. This, I told myself, was in all probability my last night of freedom. These were the people I should remember. The Fogels, the Clandon Hartleys, Rue... Schimmler sitting alone in the shadows, the skeletons murmuring to each other and smiling. And with them all, there was the warm, scented night, the drip of water on the terrace, the faint hiss of the sea against the rocks at the point, the stars and the light of the moon striking through the trees. It all seemed so very peaceful. And yet there was no peace. In the darkness beyond this little bay, Dramas were being enacted. Forces were gathering. Convoys launching. Outside in the garden, the monstrosities of the insect kingdom were creeping along the wet branches in search of food. Nothing was at rest. Nothing was still. The night was moving, alive with tragedy. When Fogel finished... There was dead silence. A silence which was only broken by the arrival of a squad of armed policemen. Could I have your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen? Which one of you is Joseph Adassi? I am. You're under arrest, sir. You'll please accompany us to the commissariat. Uh, but I... Excuse me, I, officer, I, what is the charge? It doesn't concern you, sir. It might not concern him, but it concerns me... I'm a citizen of the Republic. I have a right to know. The charge is espionage. <laughs> You've had a very dangerous man among you, my friends. All right. Excuse me. I spoke to Monsieur Duval earlier. Why, uh, look. I'd like to know what's going on. You'll find out soon enough. Who are you anyway? Just get in and shut up. <sighs> Good evening, Vadassi. Duval. I do hope you've enjoyed your little holiday. You know Lieutenant Rompeneau, I believe. Hello, Monsieur Vadassi. Ah, I see. So that's it, is it? I don't know. What do you think it is? You're going to pin the blame on me after all. I might have known. Now you... I am looking. And I can see that arresting me makes life a great deal easier for you. And how do you come to that conclusion? Well, it was my camera, wasn't it? My roll of film in the pharmacy. There's your evidence. What chance would I have, a citizen of nowhere, without... What was it? Without passport, without national status. How long would it take a jury to convict such a shamelessly guilty person? No time at all. Take him down, next case, and you'll have what you wanted. A conviction at any cost. Monsieur Verdes. I haven't finished! I've been wanting to say this for the past two days. To begin with, I thought you knew what you were doing, but it's become painfully clear to me that you haven't got the first glimmer of an idea. 
If I hadn't used some common sense and simply ignored your instructions, the actual spy would have been back in Berlin by now. You did what? That's right. Turned a deaf ear to your blundering scheme. Should have done the same with your idiotic fake robbery idea, which wouldn't have fooled a ten-year-old child. Well, not the way you did it. I challenge you to have done any better in the circumstances. It was yet another idiotic idea to add to the litany of idiotic ideas you've come up with over the past two days. And my one consolation, as I face four years in prison, is that I will no longer have to spend my mornings listening to the witless ravings of a fat, lazy, pea-brained French muttonhead. Have you got that off your chest now? Yes. Now you may gloat to your heart's content. Hmm. Firstly, I owe you an apology. What? I have had to lie to you, and lying, as we all know, is wrong in many circumstances. The first thing you should know is that every one of the instructions you have been given has had one object. That of making the spy leave the hotel. Leave? Yes, leave. The opposite of stay. But... I, I know, I know, we misled you, but the question about people's cameras, the faked robbery, those are all things intended to alarm him. We wanted to smoke him out, do you understand? I hardly know where to start. Was your plan, then, to arrest the first person to leave the hotel? It could have been anyone. Ah, yes, but we already know who he is. You already know? Yes. I'm at a loss. We felt that it was in the best interest of our operation to keep you in ignorance of certain details. Ah. We couldn't be sure that you wouldn't inadvertently give something away. So who is it? Who is this spy that you've known about all along? I'm not at liberty to reveal that. Now look here, Tuba. You'll find out who he is in due course. I can tell you this much. We had for some time been receiving reports from Germany that naval intelligence was flowing freely from the south of France to Berlin, and we were instructed to cut it off at source. Your clumsiness, uh, carelessness, call uh, it what you will, fecklessness, uh, haplessness, anyway, you mixing up the spy's camera with your own turned out to be rather fortuitous for us. We used the serial number to trace his camera to a dealer in Toulon who was able to identify the buyer from some photographs we had. The buyer's name was a known alias of one of the guests at the reserve. In that case, why didn't you just arrest him and leave me in peace to enjoy the first holiday I've had in five years? Whose war is coming, Badassi? We saw an opportunity to dismantle his network. Not just one viper, but a whole nest. I see. We wanted to get him to leave the hotel without making him think that he was under suspicion. If he thought we were watching him, well, he'd lead us nowhere. As it is... With any luck, he'll lead us to his handler. Your very public arrest tonight on a charge of espionage was the final act of our little drama. If our guess is correct, he should be leaving the hotel very soon, and we will be following him. You mean I'm not actually under arrest? That's right. Stop the car, please. Don't stop the car, Rompilo. I wasn't going to. Stop the car! I'm not under arrest. I want to get out. I have a train to catch to Paris. You'll catch a train, Badassi. We'll make sure of that. You've no call to worry. Ah, but I do worry. Because my job, my residency, my liberty and my life depend upon catching that train. Perhaps. No, not perhaps. With absolute certainty. I still need you to do me one more small favor. I don't care. I won't do it. You should care, Badassi. I shouldn't have to remind you that it is the duty of all French citizens to assist police when asked to do so. I shouldn't have to remind you, Duval, that I'm not a French citizen. Ah. You may recall that when you were in custody, I said that if you cooperated, then perhaps there was something we could do for you in return. Yes. You didn't tell me what it was. I have been in touch with the Bureau of Naturalization. There are still some formalities to be gone through, but I have received assurances that your application will be looked on favorably if you do your duty now and help us. Furthermore, here is 500 francs for your trouble. 500 francs? Yes, please don't become emotional. We still have work to do, if that is, you are agreeable. Yes. But, uh, yes... Yes, I am. Good. Now, listen. I intend to arrest our spy and anyone we find with him on a charge of theft. Oh. The theft of your Zeiss contacts. Once we have them in custody, other more serious charges will follow. We'll need you to identify the camera. Can you do that? Of course. Is it going to be dangerous? Our suspect has left the hotel. He 
Received. All right. Let's wait for him in Sanary. We can fall in behind when he goes past. Well? Well, what? You didn't answer my question. Is it going to be dangerous? Danger is everywhere, Badassi. Crossing the road, entering a pharmacy, sitting in this car. All of Europe is rushing towards war like a truck with no brakes. Yes, it's dangerous. But so what? I watched Duval fill the magazine of his pistol with bullets and snap the slide to load the first one into the chamber. I felt quite sick. He saw me watching and gave me a wink. In Sanari, we stopped in a side road and waited. After about half an hour, a red Peugeot sedan went past and we fell in behind it. Monsieur Duval, we're waiting for you at the junction with the road from Sublet. Over. Thank you, Monsieur. That was Sergeant Fournier of the Harbour Police. We're entering his territory. It looks as though we're heading for the docks. The trees beside the road became fewer and we passed a factory or two. Finally, we swung onto a brightly lit road with tram tracks down the middle and cafes on the pavements. The cafes were full. Groups of sailors strolled by, arm in arm. An old man sitting in the gutter was playing a mandolin. A girl was selling sweets from a tray. A naval patrol was trying to break up a fight. And then we took another turn and left the light behind us. We threaded our way cautiously through dark, narrow streets lined with high, blank walls of warehouses. He's pulling over. Stop here. We're close enough. Come on, Vadassi. Time to stretch your legs. Sergeant Fournier. I am Tuval. We saw him enter the warehouse through that door in the corner. Give us a minute. We'll see if there are any other exits and guard them while you go in. Thanks. Uh, listen, Vadassi, follow us, but stay behind us. All right. Locked. Police! Open the door! Take it down, Rompano. Oh, in the air! In the air! Now, cuff them! Where is he? Where's Rue? Speak! Hello! So it's Rue. The spy is Rue. Listen. He's on the roof. You should I follow him, though? I will. You stay here with the prisoners. Be careful, sir. Where do you think you're coming, oh, Badassi? I'll come with you. No, don't be ridiculous. Stay here. I let him go ahead, and then I followed. Just as I stepped out onto the flat roof, a shadowy figure vaulted the two-meter gap to the next warehouse roof and turned. Duval was ahead of me and began to raise his gun. But before he could use it, there was a flash of flame from the other man's pistol. Duval, are you all right? No, I'm not. Where are you hurt? My knee! My knee! May I borrow your gun? Adassi, don't be an idiot! I need a doctor! I could just about make him out. A smudgy shadow running across the next roof. Rue. Rue was the man who had locked me in the writing room, who had broken into my room and stolen two rolls of expensive film, who had hit me on the back of the head and knocked me out, who had ruined my holiday and quite possibly my life. There wasn't the slightest chance I was going to let him get away. Two meters isn't far to jump on the ground, I thought. So why should it be any further when it's 20 meters in the air? I leapt across the gap. I fell to my knees on the other side just as the smudgy shadow was running towards the next gap. He turned and fired a shot at me. Rue! Rue, what are you doing? It's me, Vadassi! Leave me alone, Vadassi! Now listen to me. You can't get away. There are men on the ground guarding all the exits. Give yourself up! Get back! Or I'll shoot again! It's pointless, Rue. Stop now! What the hell did you care? I'd like my film back, if it's all the same to you. Your film? Are you insane? Get down, Vanessa. Get out of the way. I'm going to shoot. No, Rumpano. Wait. 
he missed, and Rue was running again. I saw him run through a forest of steel ventilator shafts, but by the time I'd reached the far edge of the roof, I'd lost sight of him. I strained to see across to the next roof, but nothing moved. The gap in between seemed slightly larger than the last one, and as I wondered whether I should risk leaping across myself, I noticed a body on the ground below, with one leg sticking out at an impossible angle. So Rue had fallen. As I looked down, the harbour police appeared and began to surround him. He's dead! Inform Sergeant Fournier, the suspect is dead! While Duval was being taken to hospital, Rompano drove me back to saint -Gatien. We sat in silence for most of the way. I don't understand. Why did he do it? Why did he do what? Why did he stay on at the hotel and try to get his photographs back? It doesn't make sense. He could have left at any time. He's probably paid on results. I expect he needed the money. He needed the money. It wasn't much of an epitaph, but it would have to do. Ah, oh, Monsieur Vedassi. I've been expecting you. Frau Kirke. I came to collect my valise. It's here in the office. One moment. Thank you. Also, I thought you might be glad of a sandwich to take with you. I wrapped it in brown paper. It's in the front pocket. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thanks. I Inspector Duval telephoned from the hospital. He explained a few things. I feel I should apologize. You weren't to know. It seems we were both the victims of other people's clever plans. Yeah. The police gave me this. It contains 500 francs. I should like you to give it to Herr Schimmler, if you would. He might be able to make use of it, don't you think? Oh, that's very generous of you, monsieur. Emile told me that you and he had spoken. Indeed. He no longer needs money. He's returning to Germany. When? He should already be on the train from Toulon to Berlin. I see. Uh, keep the money. It's good to have a little cash in reserve, especially when the future seems so uncertain. What does it hold for you, Frau Kerker? I shall leave for Prague next month. I wish to continue the work that my husband began. Ah. Then good luck. And to you. Oh, that'll be your taxi. I believe you have a train to catch. Ambler's Epitaph for a Spy, dramatized by Nick Perry. Joseph Fadassi was played by Edward Hogg. Duval by Tony Turner. Emil Schimmler by Mark Edel Hunt. And Frau Kirker by Claire Corbett. Lieutenant Rompano is played by Don Gillet. Warren Skelton by Joseph Eyre. Mary Skelton, Franchi Webb. Herr Fogel by Sam Dale. And Monsieur Rowe by Christopher Harper. The director was Sasha Yevtachenko. Mr. Standfast, recalled from the Western Front, Hane is ordered to pose as a pacifist and sent to Glasgow. Along the way, he meets a teenage secret service agent who will change the course of his life. Starring David Robb as Hane. Er lebt noch. Scheiße. 
Engländer, komm raus und halte die Hände hoch. Mein Name ist Peter Pinar. Mein Rank ist Lieutenant Royal Flying Corps, Squadron 19. And don't you bloody call me an Englishman. Mr. Standfast by John Buchan. Dramatized in two parts by Bert Cools. Episode 1. I'd started out in Khaki in 1914 with nothing more than a great wish to see the whole business finished. But after three years, I'd acquired a professional interest in the thing. I had a nailing good brigade and a chest so full of gongs it looked like the high priest's breastplate. So you can imagine the infamous temper I was in at being recalled to England. So, how was the song? You came out of it with a DSO. And a promotion. Brigadier General Richard Hannay. Mm. Walter, is there a point to this? Frankly, I don't take kindly to being called away from my men when we're on the brink of a big push. Of course there's a point, and you know it. We want you back in with us. Huh? The old game. No, I've told you, I'm not cut out for the Secret Service. There must be someone better suited. N not for this mission. Now, stop wasting time. Duty's duty, and we both know perfectly well that you're going to say yes. Hell and damnation! What Sir Walter Bullivant wanted me to do would have been bad enough for anyone. But for me... Strong as a bull, sunburnt as a gypsy, and not looking my forty years. It was a black disgrace. My stomach rose at the thought of it. Fighting the Germans is pointless. I, I simply don't understand why we're doing it. It's so good to meet another kindred spirit. Our own tiny pacifist community, all in revolt against this ludicrous war. What is your particular stance, Mr. Brand? Well, I believe that a little common sense and um, civilised discussion would settle it rather way. With a little common sense and civilised discussion, it would never have started in the first place. Ah, Lancelot. Just in time for dinner, clever boy. Our cousin, Mr. Brand. Lancelot Wake. Mr. Cornelius Brand. Wake? Brand. Good evening. I'm sure you two men will have so much in common. Lancelot's a CEO. A conscientious objector. Well, that explained the sallow skin, the fanatical eyes, and the fact that he'd rather more hair on his head than most of us. You know, Mr. Brown, no one's done better work for the cause than Lancelot. The questions have been asked about him in Parliament. Well, someone has to bring the truth to light. The truth? About our senior officers. Incompetent, stupid, or drunk, the lot of them. You agree, of course. <laughs> I've... Heard something of the sort? Oh, it's perfectly true. And it's not just in the field. The people running this war seem to think the whole thing is some sort of game. A game? <sighs> ah, that's uh, terrible. Simply terrible. That dinner seemed to last for an eternity. But at last the creature left, the ladies went off to bed, and I was alone and able to calm my nerves. Beyond the terrace, the lawn fell away, white in the moonshine, to a miniature lake. By the water's edge was a small formal garden with grey stone parapets which gleamed like dusky marble. Great wafts of scent rose from it, for the lilacs were scarcely over and the may was in full blossom. And I understood all over again what a precious thing this little England was, how old and kindly and comforting, and how worth fighting for. Good Lord. Shall 
She was down in the little garden, whoever she was. And as I peered through the twilight, she came out into sight. Tall, slender, very young, and breathtakingly lovely. She moved with all the free grace of an athletic boy. Good evening. Good evening, sir. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, forgive me, but um, who are you? Mary Lamington. I live here. You do? The ladies who entertained you tonight are my aunts. Ah. And um, do you share their views? Don't you mean our views? They told me you're a pacifist too, Mr Cornelius Brandt. Uh, well, uh, uh, yes, that's right. I, I am. Right. No, my attitude is rather different. But don't you find it awkward, then, living here with them? It's worth it. They're my camouflage. Your what? Shall we talk about it indoors? General Hane? Here. Thank you. Look. What's troubling you, General? Well... All right. You know my real name. But how can I be sure it's safe for me to talk to you? <laughs> Walter said you'd be cautious. Well, forgive me, but you could be an enemy agent in disguise. You're right, I could. Very well. Let me prove my credentials. Three days ago, you were ordered to change your identity, correct? Correct. You're a pacifist South African engineer over here on holiday, and a mutual friend asked my aunts to put you up for the night while you visit a sick relative. Yes. <laughs> Not enough. How about this? In your pocket, you have a personal letter from your oldest and closest friend, a South African tracker named Peter Pienaar, who joined the Royal Flying Corps. <sighs> I can tell you the contents, including the sad news about his leg. Are you willing to trust me now? With all my heart. Thank you. Now, Walter told you to expect further orders. Yes. Here they are. Firstly, you're to continue with your deception. Well, I'd hope that was just for tonight. I'm afraid not. It would help if I knew why I was doing it. Because you must. I can't tell you any more than that. I'm sorry. Very well. What else? Peter Pina used to talk about getting the atmosphere of the situation. How the devil do you know that? It's not important. That's your next task. Getting atmosphere. Absorbing the feel of a particular way of life. The pacifists. Exactly. The half-baked. The people this war hasn't touched. Or has touched in the wrong way. And where do I get this atmosphere? Some rooms have been rented out in your name in a town in the home counties. Here's the address. Thank you. You're to leave at first light tomorrow. Oh, one more thing. Buy a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, the Golden Treasury edition. Have you read it? Oh, in school, of course. Read it again. Why? Oh, can't you tell me that either? Because it's a very good book. And because you might well find it useful. That's all for now. You'll be given more specific instructions when the time's right. Good night, Mr. Brand. Uh, Miss Lamington. Wait. What? Will you answer one question? That depends on what it is. Shall I see you again? Oh, yes. We're comrades now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, Dick, the Bosch doctors just told me he can't save my leg. No more hunting for me, I guess, or flying either. But they're treating us pretty well, and the smell of the woods behind the prison camp reminds me of home. So I reckon I could be a lot worse off. That dreadful news, mentioned so casually, had made me forget the rest of the letter. But now something struck my eye. There's not much to do here, Dick, so I've been getting in some reading. <laughs> Bet you're surprised, eh? I had my Bible, of course, and someone's given me another book that's just as good. Pilgrim's Progress, it's called. 
I reflected on how life throws up these little coincidences. And with that thought, and with the image of the girl who'd sung in the golden twilight filling my mind, I retired to my bed, oddly comforted and ready for whatever was to come. Beautiful day. Morning, Weeks. Lovely. Shall you be at Ursula's lecture tonight? I wouldn't miss it. I do so admire Ursula Jimson. So John-esque in her line. So, ooh, full of nuances. Ah, uh, rather. The Garden City of Biggleswick. I think it was home to every damned pacifist in the Empire. This place is one great laboratory of thought, Mr. Burns. The intellectual history of England is being made here. God help England. But I had my orders. Absorbed the atmosphere. I walked with painters, drank with novelists, and discussed politics with conchies. And I went to their lectures in the local hall. A sort of church for the undevout. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you. It turned out that Lancelot Wake was a star turn there. They loved him. Congratulations, Wake. That was jolly good. You made a lot of sense. Yes, I did. And I hear you've been coming on a good deal yourself. Uh, ah, Ivory. A first class evening, Wake. Thank you. Uh, do you know Cornelius Brand? I certainly do. Moxon Ivory, the local big cheese. They loved him, too, the Biggles Wickians. No, that's not right. They worshipped him, with his pamphlets, his articles, his talks, his ridiculous societies, and his endless pronouncements about universal brotherhood and goodwill. He was the god of academic pacifism. Ah, that's better. Now, Mr Brand... Uh, I've been meaning to have a private word. Too kind, Mr. Ivory. Uh, I've been struck by your grip on these difficult problems. You may be of great value to our cause. You really think so? I'm sure of it. A League of Democrats Against Aggression would have a valuable new member in your good self. Yes. The League of Democrats Against Aggression. <laughs> After weary weeks of enduring this sort of rubbish, I was convinced that my great mission was nothing more than a farce. Until one night, everything changed. Well done, Brad. You really livened up the discussion. Good of you to say so. I appreciate it. Now, now there, there, there's someone you should meet. I don't know if I can find her. I, uh, my dear, uh, come and say hello. This is Cornelius Brand. Good evening, Mr. Brand. Good evening. Moxon's told me so much about you. Really? Yes. Oh, honestly, Moxie, you might introduce me properly. I was sorry to miss you when you stayed with my aunts last month, Mr. Brand. Mary Lamington. Pleased to know you, Miss Lamington. Likewise, sir. She unwound herself from Ivory's arm, and I tried to convince myself that this was just more of her camouflage. Then we shook hands, and I felt a small slip of folded paper being pressed into my palm. In two days' time, go up to London and visit Trail's Bookshop in the Haymarket. Get there at two. Destroy this note. <laughs> the game was afoot at last. Good afternoon, Mr. Brand. Good afternoon. Welcome to Trails Bookshop. Thank you. And the manager's expecting you, sir. First door at the top of the stairs. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well. Mr. Trail, I presume? Come in, Dick. Lock it too, please. I know you're a man of many parts, Walter, but manager of a bookshop. Don't be absurd. Me absurd? Why have you brought me here? Well, because it wouldn't do to have Cornelius Brand calling on me in Whitehall, of course. Now, take a seat and tell me what you found in Biggleswick. Oh, a lot of ignorance and a large slice of vanity. Why the devil have I been wasting my time there? You haven't. What if I were to tell you that high-level war secrets are finding their way to Berlin and there's nothing we've been able to do about it? I'd be amazed. Some foreign agents managed to escape the entire British Secret Service. Oh, we know who's responsible. Well, well then why don't you stop him? Well, we don't want to. Not until we've found out just how he's getting the information out of the country. Why wait until then? Because we want to use the same route ourselves. Ah. Feed Berlin lies they'll take for gospel and watch them throw vital resources into dead ends. Mm, clever. I thought so. Now, your mission. Now, take a good look at this. No, he's like a Polish Jew. Is this your master spy? No, but he has close links with him. That's Abel Gressel. He's another pacifist. He doesn't exactly look the part. Yes, he's rather more militant about it than your recent acquaintances. He's the leader of a subversive organisation called Industrial Workers of the World. <laughs> hmm. They were responsible for some very nasty cases of sabotage in Colorado. He's an American. Hmm. And just before the beginning of the leaks, he turned up on this side of the Atlantic. In Scotland, to be precise. You think he's part of the chain? We suspect he's the final link before the Germans. Your job is to find out exactly what he's up to. But if your own people haven't been able to ferret out the details, why on earth do you think I'll do any better? Well, because you can get a lot closer to Gresson than we can. Huh? Fellow pacifists are all there. Ah, so that's why I've gone over to the enemy. What else can you tell me about him? Well, not much, I'm afraid. We've been keeping an eye on him, of course, but he knows all the tricks and we haven't dared risk a proper shadow. But we do know that he tends to disappear for weeks at a time. So I have to discover where he goes and what he does there. Precisely. And Dick. Mm? Mr Abel Gresson is an exceedingly dangerous individual. Be very careful. Andrew Amos, the agent Walter had appointed to be my contact in Glasgow. A tiny man with smouldering eyes, hands like a gorilla's, and a surprising hobby. Some men say their prayers, but I like a tune. The principle's the same. Now, Mr. Brand, about your man Gresson. He's sailing on Friday as purser aboard a boat called the Tobermory. Is he, by God? She wanders every month up the West Highlands as far as Stornoway. Does he do this trip regularly? Oh, that I can't say. Mm, still a lot more than London knew. How did you find out? Oh, I have ways and means of my own. Come on, get your hat. Where are we going? Don't you want to take a look at the man? Can I do that? I thought he'd be keeping his head down. Not exactly. Well, there he is. Not going down too well, is he? Dear God, they're going to kill him. No, he's away. Look. Where does that door lead? There's an alibi at the back. Stay here. Mr. Gresson! Who in the hell are you? I was in the hall. Oh, you're going to show me the error of my ways, are you? Actually, I'm on your side. Shouldn't you be getting away? Nah, I got enough friends in there to stop the stampede. They'll block the door. I suppose some of the others decide to come round from the front, like I did. Is that likely? There he is. Uh, yes, I'll say it is. Right here. Come on, Jimmy. Can you use your fists, Gresson? Don't need to. I got this. Put that away, you idiot. Get behind me. Take this side, no lads. We're no quarrel here. Go home, you fools. Leave this gentleman alone. <laughs> fools, is it? I think you need to learn some manners, Lordy. Oh, 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 oh
on stall and take it like a man. No, I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> but if it's the only way... <laughs> All right, my friend. Oh. Your turn. You stuck-up Sazanac! <laughs> That's the best you can do. Well, neatly done, sir. Ah, the local constabulary. I suggest we beat a quick retreat. Sounds good. I guess I'm in your debt, Mr. Uh... The name's Brand. Cornelius Brand. Here. Scotch whiskey. Second finest in the world. Thanks. Good health. Mud in your eye. Hmm. So you're on my side, are you? Pacifist all my adult life. <laughs> How's it feel to be in a minority? Well, I'm used to it. Yeah, I guess you would be. You live here in Glasgow? No, I'm just visiting. From down south? Actually, I'm, I'm just visiting there, too. I'm over from South Africa. Holiday? Partly. Mostly, I'm working for the cause. I've been staying in Bickleswick. Can't say I've heard of it. Oh, you'd like it. It's full of our sort of people. So why are you up here? My ancestors fought with Bonnie Prince Charlie. I want to see the place where he left for France. And some of the other sites, too, of course. Do you believe in fate, Mr. Brand? No, I don't. Well, a coincidence, then? Maybe. Why? Because I reckon I'm the very man to help you on your way. <laughs> Welcome to the good ship Tobamori. Thanks so much for arranging this. I gather that passengers aren't exactly the main priority. You've seen the sleeping accommodation. I've inspected my shelf in the corner of the saloon, yes. <laughs> Do you mind? Not in the slightest. It's not as if I can run to anything much grander. And besides, it's worth it just to get away for a while. What's the timetable? Oh, there isn't one. We just mosey around the West Highlands. Picking up and dropping off. What sort of cargo? Just about anything. Yeah, by this time tomorrow, we could be sharing the deck with a dozen sheep and a couple of goats. And you're part of the crew? Mm-hmm. Purser. That doesn't pay much. But it helps keep body and soul together. And it's a hell of a lot better than being stuck away in an office somewhere. Amen, my friend. I was feeling pretty damn pleased with myself. After I'd saved Gresson from his thrashing, we talked well into the small hours on every aspect of the blasted anti-war movement, and my disguise had held up perfectly. I never thought I'd say it, but three cheers for Biggleswick and the education it had given me. Sooner or later, on one of our stops, Gresson would be leaving the boat to pass on the latest batch of military secrets. I had a shrewd notion how he'd be doing it. North of these parts, there were some fine, deep bays, just perfect for an enemy submarine to pop up at night and send a boat ashore. All I had to do was stick to Gresson like glue, and nothing in the world was going to stop me doing exactly that. Take a look at your passport now, Mr. Brand. Captain? Your passport, sir. You, you do have one. Well, of course I do, but why on earth do you want to see it? No, 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 sir. Your, your, your local passport. Uh, the paperwork for this trip, uh, they'll no let you go ashore north of Fort William without you have a passport. Well, I've no idea. Well, so see, you, you didn't have one? No, I don't. Oh, well, it's too late now. You should have applied to the military gentleman in Glasgow, I'm afraid. You, you just have to sit on this deck and admire the works of God from afar. Oh, that's a, a poor job, Mr. Brown. Yes, I'm afraid so. Problem? How many stops before Fort William? Two. Why? Well, they'll be my last chance to go ashore. No papers. <laughs> Is that all? 
Come on. Men like us don't put much stock in governments and their two-cent laws. The police up here are hayseeds. I reckon it'd be a fine game to see just how far you could get. No, I'm not up for sport. I'm gonna have to change my plans. How in the name of heaven could I shadow Gresson if I was stuck on board the damn boat? I was still trying to come up with a scheme when we reached the first of our two stops, the clean little town that was Oban. I made a beeline for the post office to see if Andrew Amos's ways and means of my own had turned up anything new for me. P117 stop. P3 stop. A -A. What the devil? <gasps> ah! It's a very good book, and it might well prove useful. <laughs> Page 117, paragraph 3. One, two... Then I saw in my dream that a little off the way, over against the silver mine, stood a man who called to those passing to come and see the mine. Ah, Mr. Brand. Captain. How do you like Oban? I like it fine, thank you. Uh, it has a grand setting. There's copper in those hills. I put money on it. Oh, you know about such things? I'm a mining engineer. Maybe after the war, I'll come back here and try some prospecting. Uh, well, you'll make nothing of it. No? no one ever has. The costs are all big. So it's never been tried? Not anywhere up here? Only one place I can of. The old iron mines at Rana, up for sky. Do we call her? Aye. Every trip. And we always bide a bit. But you'll not be seeing those mines, Mr. Brand. Rana's well inside the passport country. And perfect for a secret meeting with the enemy, the people passing by. I wondered how the deuce Amos had found out about it, but decided I didn't much care. He'd saved me a lot of tedious work. Now all I had to do was get to Rana without alerting Gresson. And that's got to be one hell of a walk. Up Morven, round the head of Lochiel, and straight back down to Oban. Should be a smashing hike, and all legal, too. Well, I've said my say on that matter. What will you do after that? Back to Glasgow and some work for the cause. Well, it's a great life, if you don't weaken. Good luck to you, Brand. Thanks. I'm sorry to see you go. Goodbye, Gresson. It's been a real pleasure. Bye. See you again. Maybe. <laughs> Once I was out of sight of the shore, I turned due north and struck over the shoulder of a great hill. And from that point on, I was breaking the law. I can't say I let it bother me. The air was crisp and clean. The landscape was pure delight. And when I stopped for a bite to eat, I had a wonderful vista of heather and bog myrtle and wood and water below me. Funny thing, though. I adored Scotland, and always had. But now, for some reason, I found my thoughts straying elsewhere. Cherry ripe, cherry ripe, ripe I cry. Fool and fair ones come and buy. What the devil? Stay exactly where you are, sir. Put your hands in the air. For God's sake, man! You might have killed me! Tell me, Ron. You know a warning shot when you see one? What's your name? What business is it of yours? I'll tell you. I'm Colonel George Broadbury, the deputy lieutenant of this county. And a man on a walking tour is a threat, is he? He 
is when he's Cornelius Brand. What? Who, who the devil's he? Damn it, sir. I've had a wire from the chief constable about you. Middle height, strongly built, grey tweeds, brown hat, sunburn. You're a very dangerous figure. My orders are to arrest you and take you back to Oberth. I, I beg your pardon, Deputy Lieutenant. I'm not used to being pulled up suddenly in question. My name's Blakey. What? Captain Robert Blakey of the Scots Fusiliers. Home on three weeks' leave. And how the deuce am I to be satisfied about that? Well, ah, by George, I know. Put your hands down. You're coming home with me. Some more wine, Captain Blakey. Thank you, Colonel. Ted? Rather. Thank you, Colonel. Sorry about the mix-up, Captain. You have to admit, you fit the description. Oh, come on, Pa. So do most of the coves I'm walking to us up here. Grey tweeds, brown hat and sunburnt. That's practically a uniform. <laughs> The police might have been a touch more specific. Well, I'm sure they did the best they could. Anyway, your father was quite right to challenge me. What's he done, this brand chap? Can't tell you, old man. Security and all that. Mm, something serious, though, by the sound of it. Are there any search parties out? Roadblocks? Could be. Why are you so interested? Oh, I don't know. Always fun to have a bit of excitement to spice up one's leave. I'll tell you this. If you had been brand and you'd made a run for it... I'd have been well within the rights to shoot you. Good job the boy here says you're pucker. I knew he'd be able to tell a real soldier from a blasted fake. Hmm. Well, what a fantastic coincidence that you actually know people from my outfit, sir. Not really. Your brigade was just across the river from mine at Arras. It was good to hear news from the front. Maybe I'll be back there soon. Only if this blasted leg heals properly. Looks well on the way to me. Thanks, sir. I have to thank you too, Blakey. <laughs> For what, Colonel? The cheering up the boy. He was moping a good bit. Your coming's been a godsend. Which is how I came to spend that night between clean sheets and to eat a Christian breakfast. I set off next morning, offering silent thanks to the old colonel for respecting a fellow officer and not bothering to ask for my papers, and wondering just why Cornelius Brandt was so suddenly a wanted man. After four days of weary tramping, I finally pitched up on the slopes of a black mountain cliff in a landscape like nothing else I'd ever seen. In the jagged shadows of the fading daylight, the scars of the abandoned mining works turned the place into some nightmare primeval realm, uncanny and unearthly. It was a fitting location for treacherous deeds. Across a narrow stretch of water lay the Tobermory. And there, right below me, was Gresson, walking straight for the cliff face. My nerves were tight. I got quite a shock when he suddenly disappeared right in front of my eyes. Then I pulled myself together. A cave. He's waiting in a cave, of course. Good God above. Wake. Brand. What the devil are you doing here? So you're part of this business, are you? I should have known. What business? Wake. Listen. Listen. I'm involved in this too. In what? I'm working with Gresson, just the same as you. Who's Gresson? <laughs> you're not making any sense, old man. I'm just here to do a spot of climbing. You can drop the act. I tell you we're on the same side. Gresson's down there now, and I'm on lookout. We're waiting for the submarine. Submarine? To collect the information for Berlin. My God. You're a bloody traitor. You damnable braggart! No, wait. Ah, for Christ's oh, sake. You were a patriot. So will you stop this? Oh, what about your principles? This I should me. never have trusted you. I've made a mistake. Ah, wait. Sorry about this. Ooh. Oh. Now, for heaven's sake, shut up and listen. Why should I? Because I'm the worst kind of idiot. What? Give me a hand, man. Let me help you up. Yeah, I can manage on my own. Thank you. 
Oh! Right. Now, will you kindly explain to me what the deuce this is all about? And I did. I told him everything. By the time I'd finally managed to convince him, it was almost completely dark. So you're a soldier? Yes. And you know how I feel about all that. You want an end to the war? Help me down these devils. Right. What do you want me to do? Well done, the pacifist. Wake had spotted the German sub breaking surface the other side of the headland. I pulled back even further into the tiny pitch-black crevice by the mouth of the cave and hoped I wouldn't have to wait long. I didn't. In the forest, the little birds fall silent. Just wait. For soon, you two shall be at rest. Welcome, friend. You have the goods? Yes. Excellent. I bring you a message. The caged birds understand. And the wild birds? The wild birds fly free. They're obsessed with bally birds. Code names of some sort. The, the passwords are poetry. Poetry? Haven't you read Goethe? <sighs> Not a word. It's pretty poor stuff, judging by that. No, you need to hear it in the original. Die Vögel ein Schweigen im Walde. For God's sake, wake up. The Wanderer's Night Song. Did you hear anything else? Yes. A name, I think. Bar Merz. Yeah. Bar Merz. Mean anything to you? Afraid not. Was that it? No. There was one more thing. Something vital. Uh, pretty soon it's going to get harder to fix up these meetings. Take a look at this. What is that? Safe hiding place. Now, I can leave the stuff in there for you to pick up when you can. <laughs> a nice dry little cup of our birdseed, eh? Most ingenious. After they're gone, I took a look. Did you find their hidey hole? <sighs> Blind man could have followed their spore. They might just as well have left a signpost. Yes, I found it. It's exactly what I was after. So, what now? We let Gresson get well clear of here. I don't know about you, but I could do with a pipe, a bite to eat, and a good night's sleep. I'll give you your orders in the morning. Ready? Ready. Oh. <laughs> Just the thing, eh? Oh, yes. You don't get this in Biggleswick. <laughs> oh. I say, Brad, look. Isn't that a destroyer? Yes. Heading south. You don't think that Bosch sub's still out there somewhere? No. No. They'll be well on their way home now with their prize. Come on. We can dry off in the sun. Ready. I'm finished. Here. That's a map of the area, a diagram of the cave and the hiding place, and everything I've learned about Gresson. What about the conversation? The passwords? No, that's not there. Why not? I ran out of paper. Besides, I don't want to put all my eggs in the same basket. Repeat your orders. I'm to deliver this to Andrew Amos in Glasgow, speed being of the essence. Good. Look, why aren't you coming with me? I'd slow you down. I can't travel openly. Really? Is that because of the state you're in? What do you mean? 
You're togs, old man. Frankly, you look slightly less respectable than Charlie Chaplin. Oh, uh, hadn't occurred to me. No, that's not it. Oh, well, your business, not mine. What will you do after Glasgow? Back here? No, this place has lost its sanctity. I'll be going home. I'll get to Amos as quickly as I can. Here's something to think about on the way. Last night, you were in the front line. No, more than that. You were in no man's land, face to face with the enemy. You went over the top. That's one way of looking at it. Well, good luck to you, Hannay. One last thing. Yes? If anyone tries to take that map, eat it. My journey back down south was a curious affair. Now that my mission was accomplished, I set off with my heart light, reveling in the challenge of being the hunted rather than the hunter for a change. But eventually the reality of my situation washed away the thrill of the chase. I found myself reduced to sleeping in the shadows by day and creeping along deserted byways by night, no better than the lowest sort of common criminal. What? What have you done to your bricks and bits? Never mind that. Did you get the papers? Are they safe? Uh, aye, aye, they are. They're heading to their destination in sure hands. Thank God. Uh, uh, your man with the extravagant hair said you'd information in your heat to get to London. Yes. Uh, you'll not find that easy. You're wanted with the law on both sides of the border. In England, too? You're posted as a dangerous criminal. What have you been doing? Walking the Highlands without any papers. This goes way beyond that, I'm thinking. Well, there's been nothing else. Then you're powerful enemy somewhere. Still, there's no sense in fretting. There's more urgent things to attend to. You need a change of clothes and a new identity. And a good wash, if you don't mind me saying it. Hmm. I'll see what I can arrange. Which is how I came to be... Private Henry Tompkins, the 12th Blasters. I was in the uniform of a British private, complete down to the shapeless boots and the dropsical puttees. My hands were hard and rough and only needed some grubbiness and hacking about the nails to pass muster. With my cap on the side of my head, a pack on my back, a service rifle in my hands, and my pockets bursting with penny picture papers, I was the very model of the British soldier returning from leave. I also had a packet of woodbine cigarettes and a hunch of bread and cheese for the journey. And I had a railway warrant made out in my name for London. God only knows how Amos had done it. further inside. Oh, no, they want to watch. Can't blame them. Is anybody hurt? Excuse me. Excuse me. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Just a little shaken. What about you? You're bleeding. Pulled a bit of glass off, boy. Show me. No, it's not too bad. Give me your hat. Big pardon. Hold it there. Press down. Harder. 
That'll stop it till you get some proper help. Oh, thank you. Anyone seriously hurt? Oh, Mr. Mayor, Audrey, there's a man in the back row. Where? Let me through. Let me through. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Dana, what's wrong with him? Oh, there's no blood. Oh, it could be shock. Now, listen to me. You're safe in here. Nothing can hurt you here. You tried that, mate. He just lies there. Well, help me turn him over. Don't think you'll let us. Well, we won't know unless we try, will we? Come on, old chap. Oh, no. No, no, no. Don't fight me, man. Let me see if you're all right. That's the way. You ready? Right, you are, squire. One, two, three. <sighs> Good Lord. It's you. All right. Lie still. Let's have a look. No. I don't think you're badly injured. Oh, my God. My God. What's wrong with him? Is it bad? Get out of my way. Out of my way. Keep him here. He mustn't be moved. Will you let me through? Hey, you! Get back inside! What? No, I can't. Well, do as you're told, soldier boy. You want to get yourself killed? Look, constable, I have to get to Westminster. No, it's too late. He'll be at home. I have to get to Queen Anne's Gate. That's not a place for the likes of you. I want your name and number. Oh, for pity's sake. All right. Here are my papers. Hurry, please. Driver Henry Tompkins, 12 Gloucesters. Satisfied now? Can I go? You're not going anywhere, you bleeding coward. You're on the list as a deserter. Who's in charge here? I am. What can I do for you? You can explain to me why you're detaining Brigadier General Richard Hannay on some damn fool trumped-up charge. Yeah, well, he says he's a brigadier, but that don't make him one. How'd you know about it, anyway? I know because he bribed one of your cleaners to make a phone call. Now, you listen to me. I am Sir Walter Bullivant, and I can have the Chief Constable here in ten minutes if I so choose. And if Dick Hannay doesn't walk through that door in less than 60 seconds, that's exactly what I shall do. Am I making myself perfectly clear? <laughs> I rather enjoyed that. Brought back memories. Walter, listen. Yeah, excellent work, by the way. I've got your report. First class. Walter, something's happened. Something terrible. No, what are you talking about? While the raid was on, I sheltered in Hoban Station. And? There was a man in shock. I tried to help him. Very commendable. Yeah. The strange thing was, I knew him. Recognised him as soon as I turned him over. It was Moxon Ivory. Go on. Well, then, as I looked at him, his face changed. Changed? I know, it sounds fantastic, but I swear to you, it's true. Right in front of my eyes, he changed completely. No, I, I don't follow. Well, it's as if the first face had been a mask, and he just didn't have the strength to keep it up any longer. Yeah, well, you're right, it does sound unlikely. But there's more. The second face, his real face, I'd swear to it, God help me, I knew that face too. You'd seen it before? It was the man with the eyes like a hawk. The man who tracked me across Scotland three years ago. The German agent who disguised himself as the first sea lord and stole the fleet battle plans from right under your nose. The 39 steps affair. Mm -hmm. Well, you mean he's been impersonating Ivory? Maybe for years. Maybe there's never been a real Ivory and the man's past is as fake as the rest of him. That's a hideous thought. Here's another. He must have known who I really was, right from the first day in Biggleswick. He's been playing me like a fish on a line. The devil he has. He's the man you've been watching, isn't he? It's Ivory who's been supplying the Germans with information. Yes, it is. He's preposterous, but people like him. He flatters them and they tell him things. Well, it's been top level, but it's, it's, it's been damaging enough. Well, you can multiply that damage by about a thousand. What do you mean? Walter, this man can become anyone. 
He can fool anyone. He can be a politician, a soldier. He could be you if he chose, or me. What if Mox and Ivory has not been his only personality these last years? Ah, I take your point. Heaven alone knows how many top-level meetings he could have been to. For all we know, he's dined at Downing Street or Buckingham Palace. Well, if he's learned anything that crucial, he's not passed it on yet. We'd know if he had, believe me. And now we can pick him up and he'll never have the chance. It's excellent work, Dig. I'm afraid not. What do you mean? There's something I haven't told you. When I recognised him, I must have given myself away. He realised what had happened. I saw it in his eyes. He knows we're on to him. Mm. That's rather unfortunate. Unfortunate? It's a disaster. If I'm any judge, by now he'll be heading straight for Berlin with enough classified information to change the entire course of the war. Dear God, Walter, what have I done? In the past, I'd always come back to my old Park Lane flat with a great feeling of comfort. I liked to see my hunting trophies on the wall and sink into my own armchair. But not this time. Even after I'd had a hot bath, got back into my proper uniform and put a good dinner inside me, I felt no better. I was worried sick by the sense of being up against something, inhumanly formidable, wise and strong. And I was just about ready to admit defeat and chuck up the whole game. And then I noticed that one of the letters that had piled up while I'd been away was from Peter. Well, Dick, my old friend, I'm still here in the Bosch prison camp, but it seems like they're going to send me off somewhere else. They do that with the hopeless cases, and I suppose a sick old cripple like me comes fairly high up on the list, eh? Ah, oh, Peter... One of the other prisoners said I was very brave. Made me angry. I'm not brave. Not with the real courage, the big sort. The kind that you never let go of. Even when you're feeling empty inside and your blood's thin. I wish I did have that. Going on when it looks like everything's lost. I reckon that's about the biggest thing a man can do. Honey. Right. I'll be there in ten minutes. Come in, Dick. Walter. Oh, hello, Miss Lamington. General Hannay, it's good to see you again. Walter, when Gresson met the German in that cave, I overheard more of their conversation than I told you. Well, why didn't you put it in your report? I ran out of paper. Listen, Ivory is involved with two organisations. The caged birds and the wild birds. Does that mean anything to you? Not a thing. Hmm. Mary? I'm afraid not. All right. What about this name? Bommerts. Bommerts. Sounds Dutch. No, I'm sorry. Hmm. No. Well, but at least it gives us something to work with. I'll, I'll put my people onto it. Good man. Now, we have to think about his blind spot. What do you mean? <laughs> it's one of old Peter's theories. Every living creature has its blind spot. Doesn't matter how clever it is or how alert, there's always one source of danger that it just can't see. Find that one spot, and you've got cover better than any bush or rock. And then, Dick, you move in for the kill. In Mr. Standfast by John Buchan, dramatised by Bert Cools, Richard Hannay was played by David Robb, Sir Walter Bullivant by Clive Merrison, Moxon Ivory, Struan Roger, Mary Lamington, Jasmine Hyde, Peter Pinar, John Glover, Lancelot Wake, Thomas Arnold, Abel Gresson, John Garasio, Mr. Ryer, Brian McRoberts, 
Miss Claire, Liza Sadovy, Andrew Amos, John Stahl, George Broadbury, Peter Marinka, and Ted Broadbury, Ben Crow. Other parts were played by the cast. The director was Bruce Young. What have I done? Mr. Standfast by John Buchan. Dramatized by Bert Cools. Episode 2. In the past, I'd always come back to my old Park Lane flat with a great feeling of comfort. I like to see my hunting trophies on the wall and sink into my own armchair, but not this time. Listen, Ivory is involved with two organisations, the Caged Birds and the Wild Birds. Does that mean anything to you? Not a thing. No. Mary? I'm afraid not. All right. What about this name, Bommertz? Bommertz. Sounds Dutch. No, I'm sorry. No. Mm. Yeah. Well, but at least it gives us something to work with. I'll, I'll put my people onto it. Good man. Now, we have to think about his blind spot. What do you mean? It's one of old Peter's theories. Every living creature has its blind spot. Doesn't matter how clever it is or how alert, there's always one source of danger that it just can't see. Find that one spot, and you've got cover better than any bush or rock. And then, Dick, you move in for the kill. And I'll tell you just what Ivory's blind spot is. It's me. I'm the one person in the world he can't fool with his disguises. But he did fool you at first. Because I wasn't looking for him then. I'm on my guard now. I'll always be able to recognise him. I can't explain why, but I know I'm right. Excellent, excellent. And that's not his only weakness. Oh? When you saw him in that tube station, you said he was terrified. Huh? Good Lord, that's right. How the deuce could I have forgotten? But he's obviously not a man who scares easily. So this, this, this must be some fundamental flaw, mm. a soft spot in his brain that, that something about the air raid triggered. Mm. Uh, let's see, uh, the air raid, yeah, um, the crowd, the noise, confined space. Uh, well, it, it's hard to know, but it, it's something to bear in mind, even if we can't make use of it. It proves he's not invincible. Well said. Mm. I might have something. My dear? I think I caught a glimpse of the real man too, the man behind the mask. Huh? When was it? Last week. His face didn't change, but suddenly, just for a moment, he wasn't Mox and Ivory anymore. He was someone deeper, more real, more truthful. Mm, yes, that's exactly how I felt. He said something to me then, and I honestly believe he really meant it. What was it he said? He said he loved me, and he asked me to marry him. The caged birds, the wild birds. We're dealing with a poet. Did you read The Pilgrim's Progress? Yes, I did. You were right. It's a good book. I think we're playing out the same story. A great quest with a glorious prize at the end of it. Peace, you mean? Peace, a better world, lots of things. But it's a long way to the Celestial City. We'll make it, Miss Lamington. Yes, I think we shall. We must. Now you don't have to shadow Ivory. What will you do? I'm going to volunteer as a nurse. Good for you. I uh, suppose you're going back to France. Back to my regiment, yes. Back to the fighting. Shall we meet again, do you think? I think it's very likely. Then I shan't say goodbye. Good night, Miss Lamington. Good night, General Hannay.
I returned to the front on September the 13th, 1917. The thing was desperately grave, and our prospects were none too bright. The Bosch was getting uppish, and with some cause. I won't enlarge on the fighting. It wasn't very distinguished. As far as my personal quest was concerned, there was only one occurrence of any real note. Bullivant. Hello, Walter. Dig. Where are you? Field hospital. Stopped a bit of shell with my head. Lots of blood, but no real damage done. Good Lord, man. You're not tying up a direct line to London just to tell me that you're all right. Of course not. A chap here was in Boulogne last week. Says he saw someone he recognised from back home in Glasgow. Abel Gresson. Ah, well, he probably did. Gresson's over there with the latest party of Labour delegates seeing the war firsthand. Are you serious? I assumed he'd been arrested and interned at the very least. Oh, I thought there was a chance he might try to contact our mutual friend. And? Huh? Seems he's been behaving himself perfectly. I see. Any progress on those other matters? Not yet. Now you're still in one piece, Dick. I'd trust Walter Bullivant with my life, but he hadn't met the man. If Gresson had been behaving himself, I was odds-on favourite for the next Pope. The medical chaps fussed about it, but as soon as I could, I discharged myself and motored over to GHQ. I wanted to see the chap in charge of those inspection tours. Amelia Gore Booth, General. And do, please, say it. You weren't expecting a woman. Well... Oh, I'm used to it. We seem to be acceptable over here as nurses, but that's about the limit. We are capable of other things, you know. Oh, believe me, I'm well aware of it. Well, I wish you'd spread the word. Now, what was this information you wanted? I'm interested in someone who was on the most recent Labour visit, an American, name of Gresson. Ah, yes. Quiet, well-mannered sort of chap. Apparently, he stood on Vimy Ridge and wept. Wept? 170,000 dead, General, and God knows how many of theirs. That ought to make any man weep, don't you think? We had to gain the ground. Well, you succeeded. Congratulations. Is that everything? Did Gresson blot his copybook at all? Not once. Unless you count missing one of the visits I'd planned. What happened? He was taken ill on the road. Had to be left in a village and picked up on the way back. Where was that? Do you remember? Of course I remember tiny little place called O'Court St. Anne. There it is, sir. Just north of Douvecourt. Slap bang on the main route to the Picardy Front. There'll be troops and transports through there every hour of the day. Yeah, not the place for a quiet life. No, but just the spot for a bit of espionage. All right, Forbes. Back to HQ. Sir. Anne, your note received. Gresson illness confirmed genuine, now under doctor in England. Stop at strategic village, probably coincidence, but your suspicion noted. Good work. B. Oof. Uh, you are, Monsieur le Général. Encore saint -Anne. Thank you, Monsieur le Prefect. Some of these records go back several hundred years. Mm -hmm. The hamlet itself is of little note. The only feature of any interest is the chateau. Ah, yes, here. Thank you. It dates from before Agincourt, but it fell into ruin and was rebuilt by an American. Mm. 
Just enough to rent it out and make money. Americans. <laughs> Quite a list of tenants over the years. Uh, they come for the shooting of the house. Yeah. Mm. American, English, French. Why did it stop? Oh, it did not stop, monsieur. Well, the last entry is 1912. Uh, impossible. Show, show me. You see? Some imbecile must have been asleep. I remember it well. In 1913, the chateau was taken by a maker of wool from Lille. He has the lease for five years. He lives there? No, no, no. He visits only seldom. Is he there now? No, no, no. The place is empty. <laughs> Closed up. Merde. I have to do everything myself. His name has to be on the register. Jacques Baumerz. Good Lord. Hello, General. I found another candle. Good work. Hang on. That's better. Oh, yes. Now, what on earth are you doing here? I didn't even know you were in France. I'm working at Duvecourt Hospital, and I discovered who's renting this chateau. Ah, the mysterious Monsieur Beaumerts. Ah, you've been busy too. How did you find out? It's a long story. Then tell me later. I don't want to hang around here more than I have to. There's something about this place. Yes, it deserves the fire from heaven. Have you found anything? This is the only room that isn't closed up. Look at this desk. It's empty. But you see this. This panel doesn't match the others. I think it's a secret compartment, but I couldn't open it. Oh, let me have a shot. <laughs> Is that the uh, the military approach? Simple but effective. Is there anything in there? An attaché case. Hmm. Yeah. Do you want a hairpin? Uh, it's not locked. Looks like pages from newspapers. Hmm. Some notes. And this. Is it a money bag? No, it's not. Listen, I want you to do exactly as I tell you. Why? What's wrong? Move away very slowly. Right away. But why? Please just do it. Yes, y yes, of course. Bosh, filth. Do you need some more light? For God's sake, don't talk. Don't breathe. <sighs> All right. It's safe. You can come back. What on earth is it? The Hun have been dropping it from their planes. It's anthrax powder. Oh, my dear Lord. I don't know what it's doing here. I think I do. There. Look. It didn't mean much before, but now... I'm right, aren't I? Yes, you are. It's some sort of laboratory. And all those rows of jars. Bormats is refining anthrax powder by the barrelful. What lucky star made you look in there? I noticed the lock. Who puts a new padlock on a tumble-down old outhouse? <laughs> Superb work, Miss Lamington. Thank you. Shh. What? I thought I heard... Listen... Yes. This is a car. 
Perhaps I'll just go past. I don't think so. Come on. I've got the keys. I did the best I could with the panel. Quiet now. It's a transformer. Must be one of those big portable lamps. I'm going to take a squint through the keyhole. Be careful. Stay in here. Whatever happens, keep back out of sight. What are you going to do? This. Café vous. Deposez votre arm. Good evening. This is an odd place to meet again, Mr. Ivory. Vous savez quoi faire? Oui. Ivory, you, woman, put that light back on. Au revoir, Monsieur Honey. Ah! Ah! Ivory. Ah! Ivory. Damn. Blistering hell and damnation. The woman's got away too, I'm afraid. I tried to follow her. But this place is like a warren. She's probably just a servant. Not important. Oh. So. Bomet is Ivory. Or I suppose they're both someone else. Whoever he really is. Was it another new face? Completely. But I was right. He couldn't fool me. I should have shot him the moment I laid eyes on him. Except you couldn't have done that, could you? Enemy or not, you had to give him a sporting chance. I was a fool. Oh, no, you weren't. Come on. Let's get someone more civilised. Ready? More than ready. First light tomorrow, I'm coming back here with a party of squaddies in gas masks. To take care of that powder. Stop the car. Stop! What's the matter? I should have kept after her. The old woman? Why? Look. It must have been their emergency plan. Destroying the evidence. The fire from heaven. out there. You've never been out after dark. If old Matron Misery finds oh. out... What would she do? Mary Lamington. Get lost for a bit, Daff. There's a dear. You can't bring a man in here. I'll do the same for you someday, all right? I'll never get that lucky. Oh, come on, Daff. <laughs> oh, well, look at the time. Time to get back to work. Don't eat all the biscuits. I think I just ruined your reputation. Hmm. Enhanced it, more likely. That's better. Now, let's see what we've got. Mm, that's right. Newspaper pages. Frankfurter Zeitung. Der Grosse Krieg. Some French ones. Italian and British, too. Just single pages. Why would Ivory have these? Look, Gusseter's deep breathing system abolish all ills, mental, moral and physical. What about it? Gusseter's Tifa Atman system. Sistema di respirazione profondo. You're right. It's on every one. The same advertisement. Mm -hmm. Dashed odd with a war on? Oh, it's been happening for weeks. You knew about it? Each time it appears, it's slightly different. We think there are hidden messages, but none of Walter's chaps can figure them out. It's a real enigma. Did you know that Ivory was involved? No. It means they're even more important than we thought. What have you got there? Oh, it's just pages of gibberish. Words, numbers, dates, formulas. What do you make of it? Oh, my God. 
Gosh. You know what it is? We have to get this to Walter straight away. I think it's the key to the code. The case went off to London, and barely a week later I was out of uniform again with new orders. Report for special duties to Paris. This is a surprise. Can you really afford to be away from your desk? Well, it does the department good to be rid of me for a spell. It keeps them on their toes, wondering just when I'll get back. I'm going to bring you up to date. Is it uh, safe to talk here? Maxine? <laughs> Safest place in the world. If you want to keep a secret, talk about it in the middle of a crowd. <laughs> to the end of the war. The end of the war. Now... Your sickly friend, Mr. Abel Gresson. Let me guess. He's made a miraculous recovery. Not exactly. Aim! Fire! That's quite a step from letting him motor his way around France. What happened? We decoded the messages. So it was the key. What did you learn? They turned out to be the intimate correspondence of the wild birds. You've pinned them down at last. Yeah. Grissom was a member. We pulled him in for questioning, but I'm afraid he wasn't feeling chatty. But who are they? Or do I mean what? The Germans have hundreds of spies spread out all over Europe. We've known about them for years, of course, but we've only just gotten on to their code name. They're the Stubenvogel. The caged birds. It's a good label. They can't make a single move without specific orders from Berlin. But there are others, agents who are outside the bars. They're so top secret they don't even know each other's real names. And they're licensed to act on their own initiative. The wild birds fly free. Recruited from all nations, supremely intelligent and deadly dangerous. For the first time ever, they're about to gather. They're coming together from all over the world. A joint operation. Uh, either that or a pooling of knowledge too sensitive even for the code. Either way, it's been organized by that top man. Ivory running the show with forces like that. And God knows what intelligence he picked up in England. And for it doesn't bear thinking about it. Oh, I agree. That's why Ivory has to die. Mm. Ah, here comes the food. How are you going to find him? After the business of the chateau, he'll have gone to ground again. He's been in touch with Mary. What? In the old disguise. Plump and ridiculous as ever. He came to her three days ago at the hospital in Dufour. What did he want? Well, it seems she was right about his sincerity. He proposed to her again. The devil he did. Tell me she sent him away with a flea in his ear. She asked for time to think about it. <laughs> I don't suppose that went down very well. Actually, he didn't seem to mind. He told her he was off on a long business trip and he'd contact her again when he got back. Convenient for us, don't you think? You can't be setting up a trap with her as the bait. Well, I'll grant you it isn't pretty, but war isn't pretty. Uh, Nothing we do is pretty. Not pretty? For God's sake, suppose he gets wind of who she really is. I mean, how can you put her in danger like that? Dick, have you ever thought about the effect the war's had on a lot of women? Well, can't say I have, no. Then let me tell you. Mary Lamington's 18 years old. If things had been different, she probably would have turned into a sort of silly, simpering debutante who blushes when she's spoken to. But thanks to this war, she's seen real life. And death, too. She stood side by side with agony and triumph. And you've seen what that's done to her. How superb it's made her. Now she has a chance to do a great service for her country. Would you deny her that? No. No, of course not. I'm glad to hear it. And there's one more thing you should know. What? It was Mary herself who came up with the plan. While Mary was waiting for Ivory's return, I had my own rather humbler job to do. I was on the move again, this time to Switzerland. Station master? Yes. I've got this. It tells me where to go. Uh, then go there and be quick about it. I can't read it. Oh, gosh. Let me see. 
Yeah. The woman will take you. A woman! Where are you from? Arosa. Don't they have soap in Arosa? Joseph Zimmer of Arosa was the beneficiary of an old Swiss philanthropist who'd been kind enough to find him a job where his simple skills could be put to good use. But he wasn't particularly grateful. Can you cook? Well enough. Clean, wash clothes. Woman's work. This it? Keep your voice down. This is all you need. There's food in there and fuel. Water from the pump. You want anything else? I'm at the station, right? Right. Go. No soap. No manners. Right. Hello? <laughs> Hello, Peter. <laughs> Dick, that's a bloody good story. Well, I thought you'd like it. But now I want to hear yours. I was supposed to go back to England, but something went wrong with the paperwork, they said. So I finished up in this place instead. How long ago? Oh, just a few days. I thought so. That's Bullivant's doing. You're almost back on the front line, old friend. What do you mean? The wild birds are meeting here, in this village. They're coming here? But we don't know when. I'm here to spy out the land and wait for developments. You're my camouflage. <laughs> What's so funny? I never thought I'd see the day you were my servant. Well, I never thought I'd see the day you needed one. Oh, well, these things happen. Tell me about this man, Ivory. Hmm. He sounds a bad one. The worst. We have to get him into Italy so he can be dealt with on the Allied soil. Hmm. Will you do that? With a girl. Uh. When he goes to Duvecourt to see her, they'll tell him she's gone to the inn at Santa Chiara, just across the border from here. And then... A lure to catch a lion. Uh -huh. This is like the old days, eh? <laughs> Dick, my friend. What? Try and find some way I can help, won't you? We fell into an easy routine. Every morning I'd lift Peter into his bath chair and take him down into the village or round the lake and we'd both look out for anything suspicious. In the afternoons we'd wrap ourselves up and sit outside the cottage and talk about the war. Oh, tell me about the big battles. Have they got Lynch yet? No, he's still flying. <laughs> he's a white man, that one. After he shot me down he came to see me in the hospital. Said he was sorry I was lame. Because he'd look forward to more fights with me. <laughs> Easy. Oh, it's all right. It comes and goes. <laughs> oh, yes. He's a good man. For a German. And every evening I'd cook our dinner and we'd smoke our pipes and yarn about old friends and old hunts. Sometimes I'd pick up one of his two precious books and read to him. And behold, they saw, as they thought, a man upon his knees with hands and eyes lifted up. And as soon as Mr. Honest saw him, he said, I know this man. And Mr. Valiant for truth says, what's his name? I swear you've learned this by heart. <laughs> and Mr. Valiant for truth, I reckon he's the greatest man I know. Him and old Billy Strang, who was with me in 92 in Mashana land. Until a lion got him. They say you can find everyone you know in this book. That's true. You, your ivory, even me. But I'm not one of the great ones. Maybe I'm Mr. Standfast. He was poor too, and he didn't like women much. And Mr. Honest said his name is Standfast. And he is a right good pilgrim. And at night, after I'd put Peter to bed, I'd slip outdoors and have a run, up through the snow-laden pines to the ridges, till I stood on a crest with a frozen world at my feet. And my gaze always was south, for beyond a peak with a point like a needle lay the Staub Pass, and just beyond that was Italy and Mary.
Nearly ready. Dick, someone's outside. Who's there? What do you want? You've got a parcel. Here. If it's full, I hope it chokes you. Ah. What is it? Posted in a rosa. Nice touch, Walter. New socks. From Joseph's auntie. So thoughtful. <laughs> And inside the socks, away from inquisitive eyes. One of the wild birds has been brought down. An American agent has taken his place. Their rendezvous is an empty house called the Pink Chalet. Meet him there on the 13th at 9.15pm. He knows your real name. His is Clarence Dunn. Destroy this note. B. Richard Annie. Done. The same. Follow me, mister. This way. Now stick close. Can we have some light? No, no, it's too risky. We'll have to feel our way. Come on. Okay, we should be safe now. Get the light, will you? Switch is on the left. Where? Uh, ah, got it. Fuck! What the hell? Don! Don, keep back! It's a trap! A trap? I can't bloody well move! Well, goddamn them filthy bosh. You simply can't trust them at all, can you, old man? Ivory. For almost the final time, thank God, I'm so tired of that ridiculous posturing fool. Henceforth, you may address me as the Count von Schwabing. So that's who you really are. I might have known. What precisely do you mean by that? Count Otto von Schwabing. You will speak that name with respect. Respect? For the most notorious name in all Germany? How did it feel, Count, when the scandal broke and you couldn't show your face in any civilized country in Europe? It was a minor setback, nothing more. Shall we uh, have some light? Oh. Ah. And as with all minor setbacks, a solution was quickly found. I have dined with your king. Did you know that? Also your prime minister, a man of the most unbelievable tedium, but so useful, so informative. And thanks to him and to others like him, I have proved my worth to the fatherland and my past is forgotten. My exile is at an end and I'm about to take my rightful place once again. Whatever it is you're up to, you'll be stopped. <laughs> By you? Don't flatter yourself. At any moment during the past nine months, I could have put an end to you with a mere nod of my head. Bluff! And the note that so easily lured you here tonight, was that bluff? You wrote that. Meet him there on the 13th at 9.15 p.m. He knows your real name. <laughs> I could become him in person if I wished it. To copy his handwriting was, uh, was elementary. You'll never win this war. You're as good as beaten already! And now who is bluffing, eh? Three days from now, thanks to the efforts of myself and my associates, we shall be in a position to utterly destroy the entire right wing of the British Army. In a week, Boulogne and Calais shall be ours, and then Paris. And after that, there shall be peace. God! Why do I tell you these things? It is because your life is over, my dear General. But, uh, not just yet. There is one last sight I wish you to enjoy before the end. I'm going now on a little journey, and when I return, I shall have a companion, a certain pretty lady. Stop! You cur! She loathes the sight of you! 
She'll never go anywhere with you. Oh, I think she will. She is an innocent child, and I shall explain to her that she has been a tool in the clumsy hands of your friends. You really think that, do you? You blind fool. She's been working with us from the first. You say so? Hmm. Well, that is uh, vexing, but it will make no difference. I have worked hard, and I'm entitled to my pleasure, whether it is given willingly or no. God, you... <laughs> you, child. Goodbye for now, my dear general. I hope you uh, find the darkness restful. Yeah. Alfred is in. Happily, it's just as difficult to be a coward as it is to be a hero. I don't know how long it took, but eventually it came to me, there in the pitch blackness, that this infernal device had to be like everything else on the planet. It had to have its weak point. Come on, Harry, think. Think. You saw it while the lights were on. Wooden framework. Chains. Weights. Came down from the ceiling. Did it come straight down? No, nope. tighter on one side. It's hinged. So, there must be a clasp, a catch, something holding it shut. Well, I'm not beaten yet, von Schwabing. It was like something out of Conan Doyle. I gathered all my strength to leap to freedom and discovered that my right arm was the only part of me I could move. What's that they say about counting chickens? Ah, just a tick. I offered heartfelt thanks to the genius who invented the portable electric torch. By its feeble beam, I examined the thing that was on top of me. The catch I dislodged was one of a dozen or more. Blast! Ah! There was a master clamp. A single massive metal lever. Spring that, and I'd spring myself. And my torch wasn't the only thing I got in my pocket. Nearly. This time. And I was free. I'd assumed that the chalet was empty and that I'd been left to rot alone. I was mistaken. Hello? Ah. In the forest, the little birds fall silent. Just wait, for soon you too shall be at rest. And come in, warm yourself, take a drink. There's a first, you and I. I must see the leader. Where is he? He's gone across into Italy. I have to see him at once. He'll be back tomorrow night. No, that's too late. This is a matter of life and death. Can you drive a car? And so I found myself in a mighty Daimler with a forged frontier pass in my pocket, both of them courtesy of an obliging wild bird. If Ivory wasn't expected back until tomorrow night, it meant he'd other business to attend to than just collecting Mary. Please God, I might still be in time.
Yes, signore. Miss Lamington. Uh, come inside. Uh, General Hannay. Are you alone? Is there anyone else here? The others are on their way. The weather's held them up. You have to come with me. What? The, the plan? Everything's changed. Get your things. Hurry. Well I don't understand. I'm sorry, but I had to get you away. Ivory could have been there any minute. Already? But... You weren't expecting him until tomorrow, yes, I know. Somehow he got wind of the plan. God knows how. Where are we going? Switzerland. St. Anton. What about the others? I left a note at the inn. So he's escaped us again. Now of all times. Oh, it's a catastrophe. Yes, Mary. I'm afraid it is. Oh, that's better. Yes. Good. What's the matter? I was expecting someone to be here. Who? Oh, Peter, of course. Yes, Peter. Now, where's he run off to? Right. I think this has gone on quite long enough. Don't you? Where was I in error? <laughs> I'm afraid that's something you'll have to work out for yourself. It's of no consequence. The time for games is past. When General Hannay catches up with you, will you kindly stop looking at me like that? You know, it... It is a pity. I really did love you. I detest you and everything you stand for. Yes, that's what Hane said to me. You've been with him? Last night. Soon I'll take you to see him, but, but not just yet. Where is he? We had an interesting little conversation. Would you like to know what I told him? Well? That I've laboured long and deserve to take my reward. You wouldn't dare. Oh, you are mistaken, my dear. And really, I see no need to wait any longer. <laughs> Get away from her, Count! Oh, Dick! Good evening, Miss Lamington. I'm waiting, von Schwabing. Of course. Congratulations, Hannay. You are more resourceful than I should have thought. Thank you. But you suffer from a severe handicap. You have the morals of an English gentleman. You stand there with your gun aimed at my heart and you cannot pull the trigger. You see? When it comes to a contest between us, well, forgive me, my dear General, but uh, you seem to be well, positively exhausted. What have you been up to? None of your dashed business. As you please. But it seems to me that I can get away from you now just as easily as I did once before. And next time I advise you not to come charging to the rescue alone. Is not alone. Peter! If I'm no English gentleman, you bloody Bosch murderer. Whereas I am. Walter! So, I'd have to let my... Less inhibited friend there, do the actual shooting. Just say the word. No, you, you, you cannot shoot me here. This is neutral ground. I demand to be handed over to the Swiss authorities. Oh, I don't think so. Terribly unfair to give them the burden. Wouldn't you say so, Dick? Terribly. Then what is to happen to me? If you're going to kill me, me, be so good as to get on with it. We're not going to kill you. It's no longer necessary. You'll have a fair trial. I see. But first... Dick? This man sent millions of honest folk to their graves. It's his sort that made the war, not the brave, stupid, Bosch fighting men. And I don't think he's ever been in sight of a shell in his life. I say we take him to the front line. I say we make him see what war really is. Excellent notion, Dick. I'll make sure he's guarded night and day. He won't slip through our fingers again. Now, I must get in touch with GHQ. He told me about this grand plan of theirs. Mm, a surprise attack on the whole right wing. 
We picked up most of the wild birds on their way here. Several of them felt like talking. It's all been passed on to the Commander-in-Chief. So the plan's been foiled? Yep, we can't go that far, I'm afraid. And without Ivory's chums and their information, we should have blunted its claws, at least. Ah, let's hope so. Well done, Walter. Hmm. Well, von Schwabing was right. You do look done in. Now, let's get back inside. Is he gone? Safely away. Walter conjured some troops out of thin air. Just one of my many talents. Oh, don't try this brandy, Dick. <laughs> Walter. <sighs> ah, the end of the war. Hmm. The end, the end, end of the war. war. <clears throat> Speaking of appearing out of thin air. When you didn't come back, I, I got one it. Thought maybe I ought to go get help. I found him crawling his way to the station through the snow. Bless you, Peter. But what the deuce are you doing here? I well, came to pick you up and take you to Santa Chiara for the operation. Of course, we didn't know that Ivory was several steps ahead of us. How did you find out? Well, he broke into this place and discovered one of the wild birds sitting by the fire, drinking this excellent brandy and listening to an extremely poor performance of the Blue Danube. <laughs> He decided to tell us what was going on. And you lay in wait for us. He's good at that. Very good. Hmm. I'm looking forward to hearing exactly what happened in Italy. Why not now? Well, why not? Well, because now, Mr. Pinar, I think we should take a proper look around this place and see what there is to be found. Really? Really. Uh, let me help you. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> see you later, Dick. Here. Thank you. Uh. Miss Lavington. Oh, you uh, you should be sitting down here. Let me help you. Thank you. Oh. Tell me what he did to you. <laughs> he thought you were out of the picture. He was mistaken. That's all that matters. I followed him across the Alps. You went to the inn? I had to. He told me what he was planning to do, but I got there too late. So you had to drive all the way back again? I couldn't. Just as I got there, I skidded down a bank and wrecked the car. Oh, then how on earth did you get back here? Oh, God. Oh, God. I walked. That's the most... Thank you. Thank you so much. Walter was right. Even without the wild bird's information, the Germans still mounted their massive push. I was back with my old division, but there was precious little of it left. Things hadn't been going well, and there were parts of the line we were holding with no more than a man every three yards or so. Thank God the enemy hadn't learned how desperate things were. One concentrated attack in the right place, and that would have been it. But our pilots were magnificent, driving back the German scout planes before they had a chance to spy out the truth. Someone told me that Peter had asked to come into France and be billeted at one of the flying stations with his old comrades. I caught a glimpse of him on his way there, in a flying corps wagon with a batch of young lads, puffing his pipe and looking a mighty happy man. Well? well he's acting very strange, General. I don't think he knows where he is. Has he said anything? Not since they brought him here. Von Schwabing, can you hear me? I don't have time for this. Watch him like a hawk, Forbes. It might be a trick. Sir! Can they? What? Before the trial. What about it? Do the English t torture their prisoners? No. They're gentlemen. What's wrong with him, sir? He's lost everything he ever knew, Forbes. He's always been powerful, always at the top. Now, he's nothing. I wasn't there when it happened. Von Schwabing had been moved again, right up into a battle zone. 
the sort where each side could almost reach out and grasp each other's hands. And somehow, he got away from his guards. Hilfe! Hilfe! Ich bin Deutsche! Deutsch! Ich bin geklappt von Schwabinger! It was the German guns that got him. Right. Right. Yes, I understand. Thank you, sir. Hane out. General? It's not good. The French can't get here for another six hours. Six hours? We'll have to spread the men out even thinner and keep the mobile guns shifting. Keep up the illusion. Sir. Chin up, man. We're not beaten yet. General Hane, sir. Yes? You'd better come outside, sir. Well? There, sir. Where? Oh, my God. It's Lynch. General? Black plane, wings swept back. It's Lynch, that top flyer after von Richthofen. No wonder he got through. He's getting a damn good deco. Where are our boys? The boss must be keeping them well away. If Lynch makes it back and reports, it's all up for us. Look! He's one of ours! It was tiny and painfully slow. It must have been a reserve plane, a trainer, something. But by God, its pilot was a battler. And then, suddenly, our man broke off the chase and started to climb, higher and higher, till I marveled that the pilot could still be breathing. It was then that I realized. He's running away! No, he's not. Then what's he doing? He's found Lynch's blind spot. Oh, my God! He's going to ram him! Bloody fool! No, no! There had been only one way to make sure of the kill, and he'd taken it. Two heroes had fought their last battle, and we were saved. They fell just short of the enemy lines, but I didn't see them. My eyes were blinded with tears, and I was on my knees. When they took Peter from the wreckage, death had smoothed out some of the age in him, and left his face much as I remembered it, so long ago in the Mashonaland hills. We held the front till the French arrived in force and relieved us. As I marched what was left of my division away from the battlefield, the enemy guns were still speaking behind us, but I didn't heed them. I buried Peter in the lee of an apple orchard on the evening of a glorious spring day. Peter had a hero, a great man. I tried to tell him once that he was very like him, but he wouldn't have it. They found this in his pocket after the crash. <clears throat> And Mr. Valiant for Truth said, I am going now to my father's, and I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am now. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness that I have fought his battles, who now will be my rewarder. So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. That was beautiful. It was his favorite passage. This is a lovely spot. It reminds me a bit of the garden at my aunt's house. Do you remember? Where we met. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I remember thinking, this garden... The scent of the May and the lilac, the sight of the hills, that feeling of eternity and peace and safety is what we're fighting for. Yes. Miss Lamington. General Hannay. Mary. Oh, dash it, I'm a soldier. I'm no good at this sort of thing. Then let me help you. Is that what you were trying to say? Yes. 
Yes, it was. Good. Why don't you tell me some more? In Mr. Standfast by John Buchan, dramatised by Bert Cools, Richard Hannay was played by David Robb, Sir Walter Bullivant by Clive Merrison, the Count von Schwabing, Struan Roger, Mary Lamington, Jasmine Hyde, Peter Pinar, John Glover, Mrs. Amelia Gorbooth, Brian McRoberts, Forbes, Chris Pavlo, and the Prefect, Ben Onwukwe. Other parts were played by the cast. The director was Bruce Young. <laughs>